Okay. Item six, which is uh, our consideration of the uh, insurance industry, and we're joined this morning by uh, Alliance, uh, Sean McGrath, and Mary Curry, correct? Uh, AXA, Mr. Philip Bradley, yeah, FBD, uh, Fiona Muldoon, Kate Tobin, Jackie McMahon, correct? Um, I want to welcome you all here and uh, say that we are uh, thankful that you have taken up the invitation. Um, we're doing a considerable amount of work on insurance uh, with the Minister uh, and the other committee involved. Uh, and before we go to our, sorry, our opening statement, just to read a note on privilege, I wish to advise the witnesses that by virtue of 17, Section 17.2i of the Defamation Act 2009, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of their evidence to this committee. If you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter only to a qualified privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter of these proceedings is to be given, and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the effect that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person, persons, or entity by name or in such a way as to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of the long standing parliamentary practice to the effect that members should not comment on, criticise, or make charges against a person outside the House or an official either by name or in such a way as to make them identifiable. So if we start our opening statement, perhaps with uh, Alliance. Good morning, Chairman, Deputies, Senators, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you this morning and to discuss the important issues around the insurance market in Ireland. On behalf of Alliance, I very much welcome the time and effort that the Committee is putting into this issue, as we feel that it is an important topic for Irish business Irish consumers and the Irish economy as a whole. From the outset, I want to confirm to the Committee and indeed for businesses and consumers that if the cost of claims in Ireland falls, insurance premiums will fall. And today's meeting is a further and important step in the continuing work to bring about a mechanism to appropriately and fairly reduce the cost of claims and therefore the cost of insurance. Before looking at the claims issue, I feel it would be appropriate to give a little background to Alliance and our long-term and deep, deep commitment to Ireland and our customers on a 32-county basis. <clears throat> I am the Chief Executive of Alliance in Ireland, which has had a continuous presence in general insurance in Ireland for 117 years. We have served Irish businesses and consumers since 1902. We currently employ 660 people in the provision of general insurance in Ireland. We provide a wide range and variety of products serving small businesses, large companies, social, voluntary and community organisations and personal consumers. We are very proud to have made the contribution to Irish community and Irish life over that 117 years. Our contribution goes beyond serving the insurance needs of our customers and we do this through our long-standing programmes of sponsorship and support for the arts, for community uh, related projects right across Ireland. Alliance Ireland is a wholly owned subsidiary of the Alliance Group and the Alliance Group is one of the largest global insurance multi-line insurers. It has a proven mark, market leading position and a very solid capital base. It operates high standards of governance and risk management practices and it requires all its subsidiaries to adhere to those principles. In Ireland the Alliance Group employs over 1,700 people through its many different businesses here. Turning to today's agenda, I would like to say that we share your concern and the concerns of many members of the public about the costs and the availability of insurance in the Irish market, and in particular the high cost of claims here compared to other jurisdictions. Claims cost being a core driver of the availability of insurance and the premiums charged. Many business owners and individuals have understandably been very vocal on this topic. So how do we fix this problem? There are a number of factors to be considered. One is the high level of injury awards made for claims in Ireland. Second, the legal cost incurred through those claims. And third, the level of fraudulent and exaggerated claims, which is a consequence of the high level of awards. We believe that the single biggest issue, and the one that must be addressed, is getting the high level of injury awards under control. 
In case there is any doubt, we now have a clear and independently assessed picture of the scale of the problem based on the Personal Injuries Commission report published last year. The findings of that report were very clear and demonstrated that the awards, this is for general damages, excluding special damages and excluding legal costs, those general damages in the Republic of Ireland are 4.4 times those of the UK. Addressing this issue is a complex challenge and it involves addressing the claims environment in Ireland. Meaningful reform of the claims environment will ensure a stable and sustainable cost of insurance for Irish businesses and consumers. We welcome the progress made to date and in particular the recommend recommendations of the cost of insurance working group. These recommendations have the ability to recalibrate the level of awards and the associated cost of claims in the Irish market. This will have a real and material impact on premiums paid by Irish businesses and Irish consumers. To address the level of awards, we do need, also need to examine the role of the Book of Quantum currently used by the Personal Injuries Assessment Board and which is directly influenced by the awards set in the courts. We welcome the provision in the Judicial Council Bill which will give the Judicial Council responsibility for setting new guidelines for personal injuries compensations by the courts and reviewing them on a regular basis. In this scenario, both the courts and the Personal Injuries Assessment Board could then use one single and consistent set of guidelines for the level of awards. We believe such a change will bring the Republic of Ireland more in line with other jurisdictions, including Northern Ireland, where the judiciary established guidelines for awards in the courts, it's known as the Green Book, uh, leading to awards there which are, are lower than they are here for comparable uh, injuries. In addition, the proposed civil liability capping of General Damages Bill 2019 from Senator Anthony Lawler with regard to capping of general damages is also a significant proposal which we would like to see implemented. Whilst these changes will help to bring consistency in the awards levels, lower premiums will only be possible if the level of awards and soft tissue, issue, uh, soft tissue awards in particular are significantly reduced. A reduction in the level of awards coupled with the establishment of an efficient process for the settlement of claims is vital if we are to reduce premiums. In conclusion, I again would like to thank the committee for their work in this area. I would like to reassure the committee that Allianz is committed to doing whatever it can to assist in the reforms that we believe are necessary in the Irish insurance market. It is only with real and substantial reforms, particularly addressing the single biggest issue, issue the disproportionate, disproportionately high level of awards, that we will be able to move away from the abnormally high costs of claims in Ireland and towards a lower cost of insurance for businesses and consumers. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now I invite AXA to make its statement. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Deputies and Senators. I'm here today to represent AXA Insurance, which is a key operating business in Ireland of one of the world's largest insurance companies, the French headquartered AXA Group. AXA has been present in Ireland since 1999, when we acquired Guardian Royal Exchange Company, which itself had previously acquired the business of PMPA. So we represent a business which has been provided insurance in this market since 1721, almost 300 years. The wider AXA group employs over 2,000 people in Ireland in various businesses. Those businesses include AXA Partners, AXA MPS, AXA XL, Architras, AXA Global Health and AXA Life Europe. So AXA has a long growing and deep commitment to this market. In AXA Insurance, we employ 1,200 staff across both the Republic and Northern Ireland. We operate in all channels of the market here, and we offer products direct to consumers and via intermediaries and partners. Through these products, AXA provides critical support to the social and economic life of the country, AXA has one of the widest underwriting acceptance criteria in the marketplace in motor insurance across both personal and commercial. And our products enable consumers and individuals to go about their business with confidence. I understand the committee today is particularly interested in the difficulties being experienced in relation to the cost and availability of motor, home, business and public liability insurance. There has been a very significant focus in recent months 
on the cost and availability of insurance and some strong criticism of recent trends in the market among suggestions of excessive profitability by insurance companies such as us. The reality is the Irish market is relatively small in international terms, equivalent, for example, to less than 10% of the UK market, and it's very competitive, with over 30 different companies competing here. It has also proven to be a difficult market in which to develop a sustainable and profitable business with high and volatile claims costs. And we are all aware of the high profile companies who launched in this market only to withdraw or fail as times got tougher. The Irish market has not been profitable. For motor and liability insurance between 2000 and 2017, the Irish insurance industry for this period paid out 1.1 billion more than the collected in premiums from customers for motor liability insurance. The overall insurance market results improved in 2017, when for every 100 euro we collected from customers, we paid out 96 euros in claims and expenses, leaving the industry with an underwriting profit of 4 euros for each 100 euros collected. For our part, we believe we have developed a strong business model that can sustain us through various economic cycles that we expect to encounter. In the motor and home insurance markets, we have grown to a relatively strong position compared to the market generally. However, we continue to seek to compete and grow in new market areas, and we are currently competing very strongly to grow our position in the agriculture and small business sectors, where traditionally we've had a very small presence. Currently, we are profitable, but by its nature, insurance is a long-term business, and we measure our performance over cycles of years rather than months. Over these horizons, we've had good years and poor years. But on average, we have made profits adequate to justify the significant investment which our parent company has made in this market. This is an important point, as there have been examples recently of companies offering insurance products in this market who are not regulated here and who went out of business, resulting in difficulties to consumers and other market participants. In terms of the steps that might be taken that could facilitate reductions in premiums, I would highlight three areas which are particularly relevant to our core market of motor insurance. And these are, number one, firstly, reform how the courts decide in cases of whiplash and soft tissue damage. Awards for minor whiplash and soft tissue injuries in this market are 4.4 times that of our nearest neighbour, a most comparative legal system. AXA supports the efforts of the government to set up a judicial council with the task of redrawing guidelines for awards in injury cases. It is hoped that whatever guidelines emerge will be regarded by the general public as fair and reasonable for the various categories of injuries. The guidelines should be sufficiently well defined that everybody should know with reasonable certainty the value of any particular claim. Should this happen, then the problem with judicial inconsistency should cease, leading to less recourse to the court and reduced legal fees, meaning lower claims costs. Secondly, reform the workings and the legal basis around the Personal Injuries Assessment Board. PIAB was a huge success when introduced and directly led to a fall in insurance premiums of around 40%. But in the years since, the legal profession in particular has found ways to work around the PIAB and the system encouraged lawyers to do just that. Its effectiveness has been hugely undermined as a result. And thirdly, we should do more to contain fraud. I'm greatly encouraged by the increase in focus on this issue, now in the wider community and in the media. For our part, we have invested very substantial resources to tackle fraud and to discourage those who might consider it. Our Special Investigations Unit was established back in 2002 and was the first such delicate unit in the insurance industry set up to tackle this issue. But we note, with some concern, that even in cases where a judge may dismiss a case due to evidence of fraud or exaggeration, there seems to be no consequence for the plaintiff or their legal counsel. None of these issues 
will transform the cost of availability insurance, but each has an important role to play. I look forward to questions. Thank you very much indeed. I now turn to uh, FBD. Good morning, Chairperson, Deputies and Senators. Thank you for the opportunity to allow FBD give a view on the cost and availability of insurance in Ireland. FBD is the only Irish insurer. It is also the only public insurance company operating in the Irish market. We do not write any business outside the Republic. The original share capital to start the company was in £50 stakes, gathered the length and breadth of the country from thousands of farmers who, along with their families, to this day remain amongst FBD's most loyal customers. We have 34 branches and employ 900 people in Irish towns all over the country. We have direct relationships with our customers, writing 95% of our business directly and not through brokers. Farm, food and agri remains our most important customer group to this day. These days, 85% of all our premium is with small and medium businesses. We are writing the shops, the, shops, the pubs, the restaurants, the tradesmen and farms that make up the backbone of the Irish economy. Our customers' businesses are predominantly those that are family-owned and managed. We survive and prosper on Ireland's economic growth and success and on our customers' growth and success. It is the strength of our relationships with these customers and the quality of the service we provide them that has underpinned our business for 50 years. Like all good businesses, we know that our success is linked to our customers' success. We are proud of our contribution and track record to Irish business life. We believe in the social utility of our product. Opening and operating a business in Ireland today is not for the faint-hearted. There is plenty of risk in it, as any business person will tell you. But no small business could even start to hang out an open for business sign. No individual could borrow to buy a house unless the risk of a fire or the risk of being sued if someone trips is taken away from them. Insurance is the cornerstone of entrepreneurship. FBD has served many Irish businesses and continues to. We want to grow our business. FBD competes through our risk selection and our pricing. The men and women up and down the country that meet the customer, who work on health and safety practices and who underwrite those businesses and farms. We compete again and again against huge multinationals operating here and also against naive foreign capacity that is not regulated here and comes in with unrealistically low prices for a few years, believing Ireland will behave in the same way as the greater Manchester area, and then after a few areas when the losses are unsustainable, they quit, leaving a wake of destruction and the rest of the market with no background or expertise in the classes of business they wrote. This is what happened with play centres. Today, FBD is writing difficult risks, and some of these are at a loss. Examples of the risks include marts, piggeries, poultry, farms, pubs, shops, hotels, agri-contractors. We are committed to our sectors, and we are providing stability. FBD very much wants to write more business. For instance, we've written over 200 new shop accounts in 2018. We want to grow geographically, particularly in major urban centres, and we recently opened new offices in Limerick, Cork City and two in Dublin. There are many factors which influence the cost of insurance for the Irish customer, but chief amongst these is the high cost of bodily injury claims. Injury awards are also significantly higher in Ireland than they are elsewhere. At the simplest level, and if we take the example of the play centres again, the average public liability award at PIAB is €27,000. If the premium for a business is €2,500, then if there is even one claim in 10 years, the 10-year premium will not exceed one single average PIAB award, never mind a claim that goes to court. How many businesses in today's environment where the courts supply a duty of care so high and where modern standards for health and safety place all onus on the operator? And sadly, the absence of individual responsibility once the person walks onto the business premises, not to mention those few who will try it on. How many businesses will withstand that test of one claim in 10 years, let alone one where minors are involved? 
It is our belief that structural reforms are necessary to moderate the cost of such claims in the future. The current one-way bet in the court system must change. It provides an incentive for those who want to have a go, and each and every of these cases, no matter how spurious, must be defended, and that costs. Absent such structural reform and in this prevailing interest rate environment, the current high cost of insurance is of solely a function of the cost of its current inputs. And that means predominantly claims costs, particularly soft tissue injury. As a society, we have a choice. We can encourage entrepreneurship and business through lowering the cost of insurance, or we can continue to be the most generous payer in Europe. Our current injury compensation system is now directly at odds with business. We cannot have it all. Cheap insurance is an economic impossibility in this environment. Society must choose. FBD is charging more than it was five years ago. That is incontrovertible. But I would like to tackle the false idea that we are making outsized profits at the expense of our customers. It is difficult to sell price increases, and no business likes to lose customers. But if we take it as a given that, unlike other businesses, on the day we make a sale, we do not know the cost of goods sold. We don't know how many claims we will have. We can see that an insurance business can be inherently risky and difficult to get right. FBD has come from a period of five years where we have written cumulatively 1.8 billion in insurance premia, and our underwriting profit for that five-year period has been 22 million. This represents a tiny net margin of 1.2%. FBD is an open book in transparency terms. Because we are a public company, all of this information is published on our website. These are not outsized profits. The company and its employees have completed a major turnaround to make a profit of 50 million in the last two years. And we are proud of that. For these two years, this represents a normal double-digit return on equity. What we have accomplished has been difficult. All our customers are paying more. We have lost some customers. We've lost 150 jobs. We shut down some businesses. We sold our hotels, raised capital, stopped our dividend, changed our board structure, and changed management. We have invested in technology and skills, and we are now healthy and stable and paying a dividend again. FBD is a business. It has shareholders who put their money at risk, and they expect us to make a return. Like all businesses, we do not apologize for making a profit. FBD is ambitious for growth and success. We are targeting specific markets for growth, including farm, home, shop, pubs, restaurants and motor. But if we are to survive as the last remaining Irish company, competing with gigantic international names like some of those you have just heard from, we must both observe the rules of business, reward our shareholders who put their capital at risk every day, and provide a service that differentiates us from the competition. FBD does this by being close to its customers, understanding their business, and operating alongside them in our communities. We are open for business, we want more customers, but we do not and will not sell below cost. We believe the economy and the customer is best served by a strong, independent, local operator focused on long-term relationships with its Irish customers. In other words, someone just like us. This means that we must continue to survive and thrive in this crowded market where lawyers take home 40% of all court awards made, where international names disclose little and operate to different capital standards, and where foreign regulated competitors come and go at will with lit little thought for the market disruption they leave in their wake. FBD is charging an economic price for an excellent product and service. We are contributing to the Irish economy. We are now finally, after much work, making a fair profit. FBD shares the frustrations of our customers. I am in this job for more than four years calling for reform. To encourage business and entrepreneurship to lower insurance costs, there is no quick win. Tackle the legal system, tackle the level of awards, the speed of access to court, and the amount it costs to access it. Tackle the impossible standards that small businesses are held to in a personal injury court case. The total responsibility they must take for anyone crossing their threshold. Look at the enormous sums of money being made by the legal profession on bodily injury awards. Look at the vested interests. 
This is not an easy problem to solve, and only hard yards and complex issues will solve it. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Muldoon. You've read your statement into the record. Could we have a copy of that, or could we have your statement now to take a copy of it, rather, um, if the clerk will arrange that? Um, I want to compliment you on your, your, your uh, contribution here um, this morning. I think it's a very worthwhile engagement. Uh, and it, it, it's a two-way street here. While the members will have questions for you, uh, there's an opportunity for you uh, to set out the issues that face you uh, in your business uh, so that the public is clearer uh, in relation to insurance costs uh, and what can be done to reduce those costs. Uh, so, I, Deputy McGrath, you're... you're yeah, thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our witnesses and, first of all, to thank you for coming before us and for engaging on what is a really important issue for uh, homeowners, for motorists, for so many business owners uh, throughout the country. And if I can start, um, perhaps with the key issue that I think all of you have highlighted, which is the, the cost of claims and award levels in Ireland. And I think both Mr. McGrath and Mr. Bradley spoke about the possibility of uh, premium reductions in the event of the cost of claims falling. So maybe if you could tell us a little bit more about your, your pricing model. So you're in the business, essentially, of pricing risk. So if we do see, over the next number of years, uh, a reduction in award levels, say a 10% reduction or a 20% reduction, how will that feed through into premium reductions for your policyholders? So what is the relationship? I'll take that. Um, as, I state, as I pointed out, when, when we price insurance, and we're pricing insurance for the next 12 months, uh, we have to set out um, our, our premium on the basis of what we expect to happen in terms of the number of claims over that 12 months. We then have to estimate and project what those claims are going to cost uh, to settle out over probably an up, up to another eight years uh, period. Um, and over that time, it's subject to lots of different influences uh, and um, variations, whether it's due to inflation or changes in the courts or changes in regulations and so on. But the vast bulk of what drives the, the premiums is the cost of claims. Um, and as has been stated, I think when you look at for each hundred euros of premium, um, overall 94% gets paid out um, in, in, is, is a target we have and we expect that sort of in, in total 67% of the hundred, so 67% will be claims costs. So any reduction um, in claim awards will affect that 67% that part of it. Uh, and that will be that will be passed on um, to our customers. So, can you can you quantify it for us? If we see a 20% reduction in award levels over a period of time, what will that result in for the policyholder? Well, that, that will vary by the different types of uh, business. If you're, if you're um, depending on whether it's a commercial account or a, or a, a motor account um, or a pure injury liability account, obviously the impact is is, is different. But the full effect of it will be passed on uh, in, in terms of our pricing. So in effect, ultimately, when it all washes through the system, is it euro for euro? Um, well, it, it won't. It's, it's, um, we, we, have to, we have to be careful in terms of uh, our pronouncements on this because the Competition and Consumer Protection Committee uh, have indicated that we have to be very careful about making pronouncements in public on pricing direction. Um, so going beyond the fact to say that the, the full effect and the full benefit will be passed on to consumers um, is as far as I can go. I can't give you a, a, a number to say exactly okay. what. But, but you're saying the full benefit? The, the full benefit. So I take that to mean the, the, that X percent reduction in award levels over time will result in X percentage, the same percentage. Well, I, I, I think the best way of putting it, Deputy, is to say, we, from, from Alice's point of view, we are making profits as well. We're making the level of profit that we believe is sustainable uh, for an insurance market. Um, well, what are your figures, by the way, Mr. McGrath? Uh, our our, our figures for, 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 for 2018, for uh, 2018 uh, we wrote premiums of, in the, in the Republic of Ireland, we wrote gross written premiums of 499 million. 499. Yep. Yeah. And we made profit before tax of 37 million. 37 million. Okay. Okay, Mr. So Bradley, that, so can, can you maybe just put on the record your own figures as well uh, and 
give us your response to that question of what will be the, the impact for consumers, for policyholders, uh, of an overall reduction in award levels? Okay. Um, firstly, the, the profit. Uh, the profit after tax for last year was 89 million, based on our turnover of 770 million. Um, as I mentioned in my kind of opening statement, you need to look at profitability over a period of years. If we were to look uh, over a period of five years, um, on average we make a profit of about 38 million. And for every 100 euros we've collected from customers, we've paid out 98 in, uh, in, in claims and An expenses. 38 million per annum, is it? Per annum, yes. Yes. Um, in terms of um, if the cost of claims comes down, uh, our, our target as a group is that for every 100 euros we collect, um, claims and expenses <coughs> comes to about 95. So there is five left for, for, for profit and to reward our, our shareholders. Um, if the cost of claims comes down, premiums will come down as well. As I mentioned in my opening statement, um, when, when the personal injury assessment board came in, prices came down over 40%. So if claims costs come down, prices will come down. By the same amount? Well, it, it depends. Um, I suppose the thing to take care, care about is, depend, um, is that there are a lot of constituent parts of, 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 of premiums. So at the moment, for instance, the cost of damage claims, because vehicles are getting more expensive, is going up to eight, between 8 and 10 per cent per annum. The cost of very serious injury claims, where there's a lot of kind of medical inflation and, um, and cost of care, no, we have 60 claims over half a million at the moment, um, with more, more than 100 million of estimates. So the cost of those claims are increasing. But certainly, if the cost of, the cost of any category claims comes down, then premiums will come down accordingly. Okay. Ms Muldoon, can I ask you, uh, are we on the right track overall in terms of the cost of insurance working group, the reforms that are being introduced? Uh, in your view, will they work? You gave, I think, quite a hard-hitting and frank opening statement, which, which I welcome. Um, but can you give us your perspective of the changes that have been brought in so far, the changes that are in the pipeline, the pace of changes, but overall, are they in the right direction and will they work? Um, uh, uh, thank you, Deputy. I, I think that uh, from FBD's perspective that some of what has been brought in so far increases transparency. Insurance is complicated for a consumer or a business to understand. I think the Judicial Council, uh, if the bill goes through, is welcome, but I think we have to see action from that Council. So the setting up of the Council in and of itself won't actually lower the injury awards. We'll have to see, uh, we'll have to see the Council operate and implement standards, and, and the bill is quite wide-ranging. I think, um, and, and I pass this to my colleague Jackie to make some comments on claims, I think... Uh, it, while it's difficult, as um, Mr. Bradley has said, to extrapolate from a drop in the war, awards to a drop in the prices, and we are being investigated, as uh, the CEO of Allianz has said, and we have to be careful around price signaling. I think that uh, within the court system, I think that is almost unaltered in terms of uh, behaviour. So none of, the, uh, none of the reforms that have been implemented so far from our perspective has had much impact uh, in the court system. Much uh, or any? Uh, the, the, we are seeing some moderation in awards at the, at the upper end by the judiciary themselves. So there, have been a, there was a, a notable court of appeal case where a, a lower court uh, uh, was overturned in terms of the quantum of the award, but it is patchy, and I can ask Jackie to uh, comment some more. Thanks, yeah, uh, Sean. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, the, look, we're, we're aware that the um, cost of insurance is too high. Uh, we know there's too many claims. We know those claims are costing too much. And you know, one side part of this equation is the discussion around too many people taking claims, and then the award's been too high and then the cost of getting to a decision being too high. So of those three elements there, if we focus on the award being too high, the compensation element, I think we've already discussed the need for the Judicial Council, the need for them to come up with a book of quantum, the need for that book to value claims at about one-fifth of what they are now, and then the need for the courts to apply that and apply it consistently. Now the other side of the equation, which probably gets 
less discussion and less debate is the cost of getting to a decision. And that is quite onerous and quite expensive. And just to colour it, I'll, I'll just give a couple of examples, real quick ones, around the cost versus the settlement amount, okay? To just focus on the cost of getting. And really I'm talking about here is the need for reform of the legal system. So uh, these are recent enough. Work-related stress claim, settlement amount uh, 60,000. The plaintiff costs 73,000. Slip and fall in a car park, 15,500 compensation. Plaintiff costs 16,200. Finger injured unloading a product from a lorry, settlement amount 12,500. Uh, agreed plaintiff costs 20,000. Equine-related employment accident, 81,000 settlement cost, plaintiff legal costs 108,000. So I think when Fiona talks about the, the hard miles, there is a lot to do and it's difficult to reform the legal system. Uh, it's slow, it's antiquated and it's costly. And frankly, it's very protected with very little motivation to change it. And what we're doing is we're, with good intent, bringing more legislation which increases complexity and increases obligations on citizens and on businesses. And it's this complexity, it's these obligations that create a lot of room for argument. It's an adversarial system, it loves argument, and it profits from that argument. And, you know, in particular, when we talk about the Group to Review Civil Justice, which was announced in March 2017, I greatly welcome that. I uh, look back at the concerns in this area that have been highlighted for over 40 years. And I talk to things like the Restrictive Practice Commission in 82, the Fair Trade Commission in 90, the Legal Cost Working Group in 2005, the National Competitors Council in 2010, 11 and 12, and the Troika requirements in 2010, and there's a host of other reports before and after. And grabbing that nettle is, 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 is absolutely required to help bring down the cost of insurance. And I certainly support the group of the, uh, of to, to review civil justice, but I'm an optimist, I'm holding my breath, and I'm afraid I might get a little red in the face. <laughs> If I may, yeah, you can. Yeah. Could you just repeat those figures for me again, please? The ones you gave earlier. The figures. Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. Apologies. Yeah, I, I'll give you a copy as well, if you like. Yeah. Uh, Work-related stress claim, uh, sixty thousand was the settlement amount. The agreed plaintiff costs. It's not defence costs. It's not our own costs of administering it. Was seventy-three thousand four hundred. A slip and fall in a car park, thirteen thousand five hundred. The plaintiff costs are 16,000, 200, 220 actually. The finger uh, injury unloading a product from a lorry. Uh, settlement cost, the compensation payment, 12,500. The plaintiff legal costs, 20,477. Equine related employment accident, 81,313. The plaintiff costs, 108,918. When was this? When were these? When were these? The dates on those? All right, they're all uh, recent, recent, recent settlements. The date of accident might be anything up to six, seven years ago. When were these settled? Just uh, recently. And, and how long ago did the claims happen? Oh, they were being settled in the last number of months and they would have happened any time up to uh, between three and seven years ago. Okay, thanks, sir. Um, just on the, yeah, on the issue of fraud, so can, can you tell us from each of your perspective uh, how prevalent it is. So for every 100 personal injury insurance claims uh, that land on your desk, uh, how many of them typically are either exaggerated or downright fraudulent? Okay. Uh, if, if I may, Chairman, can I just make one comment in relation to the, yeah. the last issue? Um, from, from Allianz's perspective, and we, get a, we, we have a global view of many markets and, and what happens around the world, uh, every single market has its own uh, potential issues and, and struggles with, with um, the same kind of issues we struggle with here in Ireland. But the one issue where we stand out compared to other markets is the level of awards uh, compared to the markets. And that, that is the biggest single issue that we need to reform in Ireland. In relation to fraud, um, we would see from um, our investigations of any, any, on personal injury side that uh, up to 20% of cases would have potential um, issues or potential um, signals, signals that we would then have to look at to, to investigate further. So probably one in five cases um, is ones that we would investigate. Uh, not all of those 
progressed to being... Um, OK, but when you reach a conclusion following your assessment, how many of them, out of the 100, in your view, as a conclusion, are fraudulent? I don't, I don't, have, that number with me. I don't have that number with me today, sorry. I'm just saying up to 20% require investigation Re and follow Require through. further investigation, yeah. yeah. Because there are some red flags. <clears throat> But you can't say at the end of that then how many... I, I don't have that figure with me today. Okay. Can anyone else give us a sense of the prevalence of it? I could. Um, it, yeah. Clearly it's very difficult to know. Um, you, you only find what you find. Um, so for, for we have a fraud team of 18 people and 15 investigators on the country. Last year our fraud savings, which we identified, were just over 19 million which is about 4.5% about of premium. Uh, but we don't know what we didn't find. That's what we found. Savings of 4.5% of, of premium? Yes. So what would that translate into in respect of the proportion of claims? Well, uh, about 20% about of claims have an indicator and about 10% of claims go to our specialist fraud team for further investigations. Okay, and can you give us then the conclusion of that? And the conclusion of that is that that's, that's the saving I mentioned of 19 million, which is about four, four, four and a half percent of, of our total premium we identify as fraud and save. Okay. FPD? Yeah, I, I'm going to pass this one uh, to Jackie as well. I will say, and I think um, uh, exaggerated claims are at least as big or a bigger issue than uh, fraudulent claims, and we don't know what we don't find as well. Uh, I think, uh, from my perspective, I believe that if we could lower the court awards, we would lower the incentive to take a case, uh, to take a fraudulent case. It's a one-way bet at the moment. It's uh, uh, have a go, and if you lose, well, you're not going to pay costs anyway. So, uh, um, so there is a kind of one-way incentive at the moment. Um, so I think if lowering bodily injury awards in the courts will help with the with tackling fraud as well. Do you want to give our stats, Jackie? I think um, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with those kind of broad estimates. Um, we certainly will be finding um, fraud, as, as we call it, fraud savings, which are, are ones that will be absolutely identified as being fraudulent um, at the order of it's just, just ahead of, the 20, of, of 20 million. And we do reckon that it is running at about, uh, fraud is about 20%, of which we, we catch about, about half of it. But I think the other interesting... 20% of claims. 20% of claims, yes. Involved fraud. Well, our actually, yeah, we're, are involved fraud. Now, it's interesting the question you asked there in terms of fraud versus exaggeration. Yeah. And where is that line between, you know, a fraud in terms of just um, a staging an accident, for example, to somebody who is, who is, who is exaggerating, exaggerating, exaggerating significantly? And I think um, absolutely, first and foremost, we are in the job to pay claims. We are in the job to look after people who are, who are injured and who suffer loss and damage. But the amount of exaggeration and how our system is feeding that exaggeration is really, really, um, I would say, you know, a very much more significant than the, the actual uh, pure fraud that we're, what I call pure fraud, I don't even like using that uh, um, 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 statement. So what I'm talking about here is, for example, we, do, we hardly see a soft tissue injury now with a very minor accident that doesn't have psychological trauma associated with it. We, um, there is a lot of use of MRI scans and um, you know, looking for what are essentially degenerative change to beef off up the um, claims that are coming through to us. Um, where there's a lot more use of pain management consultants to find the pain and then to treat it. And this all feeds into that very long process that can be stretched out three, four, five, six, seven years. Um, and essentially what's happening there is they're, very, they're building the case and that case is resulting in, in very exaggerated. I mean, one other example I, I would throw around exaggeration that would not have been a feature um, um, previously would be the cost of care. So cost of care is absolutely necessary in, in cases where people are really badly injured. We pay a lot of that in, in catastrophic, very sad, tragic cases. Uh, what we now have is claims coming in for cost of care for people with very minor soft tissue injuries. They need you know, people to do their gardening, they need people to do their domestic chores. They need, so you know, that's not classified as fraud, but you know, to the man on the street, and, and, and certainly from my perspective, you know, that exaggeration is, 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 is absolutely driving up <coughs> the cost of the claim and the payouts. Thanks, Chair.
Uh, Deputy Doherty. Thank you. Can I just pick up on uh, that point in relation to fraud? Um, you, make, you make the claim that 20% uh, are, are fraudulent claims, or suspected fraudulent claims. So, just, just in relation to kind of numbers, how many claims would, do, do you know do, does the insurance sector get per month? Straight to yourself. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very hard for as an individual company to answer on behalf of the whole sector. So, um, I, well, how many I mean, we're are... not in, in deputy. Uh, another thing and another issue in the fraud space is we are not allowed to share our data with any other company. And the GDPR rules actually, uh, although they protect citizens, in this case they work against uh, us being able to say this person to a different company, well, went and did something in a different company and now they've come to FBD, so if we were... If, well, can I ask you, Ms. Ms. Muldoon, how many claims do FBD get per month? Well, we get about 60, 65,000 claims a year. 65,000 claims a year, so you're suggesting that, what, a fifth of those are, are, are fraudulent? Well, I've given it to you on value there, the number as opposed to on on hard count number, but yes, 20%. Well, there'll be a correlation between... Yeah, absolutely. So you're talking about 15,000 claims are fraudulent. That's why FBD, because I think we need to we need to cut through some of... You know, we have the insurance industry here, which I'll go into some of the details, but we have a very different experience listening to consumers and all the rest. You'd listen to is that uh, you should all need to... I, I think the, the, the count might be... But just um, on the 15,000 figure, so 15,000... 15,000 15, might be slightly high, because the count includes... Um, okay, let's say damage, property, uh, windscreen, those type of claims okay. that are probably less fraudulent in. Let's say 10, being generous to you, given that you said 20%. So 10,000 claims, you think, <coughs> per annum. Now, how many of those claims have you reported as fraudulent? Have we reported? Sorry, I think, you, I think you may have misunderstood, Deputy. I think the number that uh, my colleague is giving is a number that we suspect uh, that there might be fraud or a severe exaggeration in it or that warrant further investigation. I believe that's the number uh, that my colleague is giving you. And I think uh, it's important to come back to what was said by Jackie earlier, which is that uh, the, what okay. is an outright fraud, the staging of an accident or, or pretending you... That versus what you have exaggerated in oh, terms know, of how badly in hurt here, you are. He's come in here with your big profits and big, big increase in profits and people are being fleeced and gouged by the insurance sector and you point the fingers at the customers because it's all about fraud, it's all about levels of claims and we have headline figures which are startling that 20% of claims are fraudulent. That's the impression I got. I'm sure that's the impression that anybody, uh, the public would get. So if you want to maybe revise the figure, how many fraudulent claims do you think FPD get per year? Fraudulent claims. Because the question is, the real question is, how many have you reported? Well, do, do you, sorry, for a Go ahead. Um, there's, a, there's a couple of things in, 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 in it. Um, first of all, the, the, um, the level of proof that we require is, is beyond reasonable doubt. It's, it's the criminal level of, of, of proof to convict for fraud. And, you know, report. pardon? Do you, not have, do, you, do you not have a system where you can report fraudulent claims? We do, yes. Who do you report them to? Report to the Gardaí. Okay. You don't need a level of proof. It's up to the Gardaí then to investigate. Would that be correct? That's correct. How many fraudulent claims have FBD reported to the Gardaí? Because it's definitely not 10,000, let me tell you. It's not 15,000. It's definitely not the 20% figure that you've talked about. So I want to get to real facts here instead of the spin from the industry because it doesn't add up. Because let's just, let me say this, because this is the questions are going to be asked about all of you who are making these accusations. 19 cases by the entire industry were reported to the Gardaí between October and March. Now, if FBD are telling us that between 10 and 15,000 are fraudulent, and Alliance and AXA will tell us roughly the same, we had the 20% figures and all the rest, it doesn't add up. Or if it does add up, you don't give a damn about it because you aren't reporting them. So, like, can I ask you, how many cases of fraudulent activity have FPD reported to the Gardaí? I can, 
I can certainly give you a few. less than five. I can certainly give you a few examples. How many numbers? How many? I don't have them off the top of my head. Would it be less than five? Um, less than five. Report to the Guardian. Between October and March of, 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 of <coughs> since last year, October, November, December, January, February, March. Deputy, we will have to get you the figures. Okay. Uh, my colleague has said he doesn't have the figures. So, of the 19 reported by the entire industry, would you accept that you haven't, you couldn't <coughs> have reported more than 19? Obviously. Obviously. Okay. So if there is such an issue with fraudulent claims, and I'm not suggesting that there is no issue with fraudulent claims, what I'm suggesting is that the industry here is completely exaggerating the issue of fraudulent claims in a way to try and, uh, to try and uh, justify the type of premiums that you are charging and the increases that we're seeing in certain sectors. So no. if there is such an issue, Ms Muldoon, in relation to fraudulent claims, how how FBD at the very most only reported 19 suspected fraudulent claims to the industry when you get 65,000 per annum. Do you think you're maybe portraying the issue in a rather black and white fashion? We have said, and I'll say it again, that the number that was given by my colleague uh, speaks to claims where there was a component where we believe there was exaggeration or fraudulent or some element of overstatement of the actual injury suffered. So I think portraying it as black and white, the guards would not thank us if we brought every single one of them to them before we had investigated further. We deploy significant resource to investigate and to manage those claims into a position where the business owner or the individual will see the claim paid and uh, have the matter managed and taken away from them, which is what they're paying us the premium Ms. for. Muldoon. Our numbers are more transparent than any of our competitors. We're a public company. All our numbers are out there for all to see. So uh, we simply have made, and I've given the number before, 22 million on 1.8 billion collected. The vast majority of what was paid away was paid away on claims and associated claims costs. Okay, so I'm not talking about exaggerated claims because the issue of exaggerated claims is a, a, an issue of dispute between the insurance industry and the person who's making the claims, whether uh, it's, it's a matter of opinion which will eventually either be settled by the industry or settled in court. I'm talking about fraudulent claims, which is a criminal, which is a criminal uh, issue. And we have said we don't have those numbers with us. We're but, happy to get them for you, Deputy, you, and but, bring them back. Well, look, the reality is, and I appreciate that, but the reality is you've confirmed that over a period of six months that you couldn't have reported uh, and you didn't report more than 19. We also secured the only conviction in this area in 2018 on an arson case in Cork. I welcome that. I want to get into the issue of fraudulent claims, not exaggerated claims. So the question is, let's deal with fraudulent claims because that's a se separate issue. It's a headline. It's a nice headline from the industry. Do you believe the fact that the insurance industry, and anybody can answer this, that the insurance industry only reported in a period of six months 19 fraudulent claims to the Gardaí. Do you believe that that's an accurate reflection of what is actually suspected fraudulent claims within your own industries? Or are you just not reporting them? Or what's happening here? Because you're coming in here telling us it's, a, you know, it's about fraud. Yes, it's about sector claim, but it's about fraud. How many have you, how many have you reported? Since June 2018, we've uh, reported 48 claimants to the Gardaí. Since June 2018. Yes. So, uh, and so from June 2018, so it's a, a period of That's a year. Good. How many claims do you get? Uh, in, a, in a year, we get 5,000 injury claims. 5,000 in injury claims. So that's what, one percent. Yes. Okay. So and so there's a suspected fraudulent fraudulent. The number of 20 percent is, as we said, yes, where we have uh, had indicators of potential fraud that we have to investigate further. Why didn't you report them to Gardaí if you believe that there's potential fraud in them? Well, the, the indicators um, have to be, you have to investigate and make sure you're not wasting uh, okay. Gardaí time. So, you so investigate we, we investigate to a certain level before we pass them. And then on 19% of the cases, you, you, you believe that there's no fraud there, so that the real figure is 1% no, no, of that, where there's suspected fraud? <clears throat> not, not, um, 
not totally. So depends on what happens and along the way. Some of them don't Surely turn, some of them don't turn into fraudulent claims, Mr. McGrath. No, we don't accept fraudulent claims, but some of them don't turn out to be uh, provable. Or you don't have, have the evidence. To, you do not have to prove them. It's not for the industry to prove whether fraudulent. It's for the industry to report a crime, a suspected crime, to the Gardaí. Surely you are reporting suspected crimes to the Gardaí so they can investigate. You have told me that your own, after your own internal investigations that you are only reporting 1%. Is that in, the accurate figures in relation to suspected crimes? That is the crime? last figure in the, in the last 12 okay. months. There are a lot of other claims that are still, un, still undergoing investigation. Yeah, okay, but that is over a period of a year, which gives us a good sense. Mr Bradley, fraudulent claims, how many have you reported to the Gardaí? We have record, referred 50 files to the Gardaí. Um, what which, period? That's since 2013, 2013, and we've had 13 prosecutions with four individuals having jail terms. Okay, so you, over a six-year period, uh, you've reported 50, 50 claims, which is about what eight, eight claims per annum. How many claims are, are, are has been processed? With injury claims, we get about 5,000 per year. Okay, so a, 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 a fraction of a percent is the suspected fraudulent claims within your sector, within your insurance company, would that be correct? That we, I suppose that we think uh, there is sufficient proof that they can go to the Gardaí and um, there, there, is a lot, there are a lot of claims where we expect, where we, I mentioned to you earlier, about 4 per cent of our claims cost we identify as fraudulent. So it is not the biggest issue by, by any means. Uh, I do not think we are portraying it as the biggest, biggest issue. Um, but only a small number are referred to Gardaí where we think there is a, a realistic um, a potential of, of, of being proven um, and prosecuted. Should you not, should you not, if you believe that a claim is fraudulent, should you not report it to the Gardaí regardless? Like, you have carried out your own internal investigation, you believe that the claim is fraudulent, you are willing to come here before this committee and suggest figures of, of potential fraudulent claims, but when we actually drill down to out of 5,000 claims per annum, you are only reporting eight. So eight is the accurate figure of what you are suspecting is really fraudulent. A number of claims are, a number of fraudulent claims are withdrawn. And, um, but it does not matter whether withdrawn, the crime has been, the crime has been committed that made it. Take, it doesn't matter. It may, it may save you, but somebody's committing a crime. You have to report it to the Gardaí, whether they're withdrawn or not. Mm. Mm. I'll take that point. Okay. Okay. Because this is the, the issue here. We've listened for to quite a while in relation to this this issue, and it's 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 a. And I, as I said, I'm. I know that there's issues in terms of fraudulent claims. I know that there's issues in terms of exaggerated claims, but not at the scale that users that the user. Uh, that you are suggesting, and the last 10 minutes have just proven that. Uh, and in fairness, you know, we've heard figures about 20% and 10% and so on and so forth. And I know you're shaking your head, Ms Muldoon, but you have failed to report fraudulent. Either you're failing as a company to report fraudulent claims, or you're completely overestimating to the public the number of fraudulent claims because you have reported less than 19. I think you're conflating two distinct issues. I'm not conflating two. I'm, I'm not complaining to distinct issues. Do you, do you, off your claims, which is what, 65,000 65, per annum? Is that correct? We have already, uh, we're going around in circles, Deputy. We've already so, said we'll have to come back. We haven't brought the numbers uh, uh, with us. Okay. In relation to, um, in relation to the the reforms that uh, many of us in this House are, are arguing for, uh, which would see the issue of claims uh, being dealt with, seen in terms of the Guard the Frauds, the fraud, fraud Squad or, or a variance of that being established. When will the insurance industry give us some transparency and uh, tell their consumers and indeed us as politicians who are bringing in these type of reforms what that will mean for customers? So, for example, we had, back in October 2002, we had um, the Irish Insurance Federation, which was the predecessor to your, your, your parent, your um, company, Kenny Insurance Ireland. They gave us a list of reforms which would match reductions from the industry. So they told us, for example, road safety strategy would result in 10% reduction. 
uh, reduction on insured drivers would result in five and so on and so forth. Anti-fraud measures 1.75 per cent. The industry are completely unwilling to provide what they did uh, over 15 years ago. Why? If we are willing to bring in the reforms, why aren't the industry willing to say, if you do this, we will reduce premiums by X, Y and Z? Because surely you can calculate uh, the risk component of, each, of, of all of those. Can I ask Mr McGrath that question? Uh, again, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the Competition and Consumer Protection Committee um, have indicated and, uh, that insurers are not to be making public pronouncements about the future direction of um, pricing. Uh, so we don't believe we can... We'd love to assist you and, and, and highlight what the savings could be, but we're, we believe we're precluded from doing that. Um, but I can again give the guarantee that, you know, should claims costs come down, uh, Allianz will reduce its pricing. You know, again, our pricing, uh, we, we priced to um, deliver a margin of 6% on underwriting. Um, if claims costs come down, um, the additional margin will be passed on to consumers in, 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 in the form of reductions. We, we won't, we won't be changing our, our target margin, yeah. so any savings will be passed on to consumers. So and I don't believe we can go any further publicly in terms of saying how much uh, or when. So claims costs aren't coming down, you will, you will, you will argue. Your profits are increasing quite sizably, but premiums aren't going to come down. Our, our profits are now at a level that we believe is sustainable, is at the target level that we require uh, for, um, to continue in business and to make sure we will continue in business in the long term to pay all those claims, for, uh, which will take you know, five, ten years to, to be paid out. Um, so are you saying, Mr McGrath, that if next year indicates uh, an, another increase, say, of 50% or 10% of, of profits, what you'll do is make sure that that is passed on to the consumer? Absolutely. Our Absolutely. pricing, we, we, tar we, 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 we target to, to deliver a 6% margin on underwriting. Uh, it's, a, it's not a, um, a, a simple exercise I outlined earlier in terms of pricing is, is a fairly complicated and involves a lot of projection, but it's constantly re-looked re at and refined and we will pass on any savings uh, that, that happen. Okay, last question. Mr McMahon, you gave an indication of, of very clear figures in relation to uh, some claims that were made. I presume all of those were settled in or were, were court. None of them were settled by the industry. Would that be correct? Some of them were court and some of them were settled out of court. Okay. Were, was, were they FPD claims? There were claims against FPD, yes. Okay. Can I ask you why are you coming here with these kind of, because obviously we don't know, you know, the slip and fall, as you say, in a car park. You can look on the internet and you'll find that there was a slip and fall in a car park. It was a 74-year-old woman. There was wet paint, no cordon off, no signage, no nothing, seriously damaged, dislocated her shoulder and all the, all the rest. But if there was cases that you settled, why are you, t why are you trying to shock us into the amount that you settled? Do you know, like, you know, if you, if you settled this, if your company settled these cases, why, if you think that there's something wrong with that, why didn't you challenge that? Because this is one of the issues that people have, that insurance companies are settling too easily. So can you explain that? Because you, you presented these figures as kind of shock and awe, look at this here, but you, you forgot to tell us actually, you agreed to this. This wasn't a judge. So we can come in and, 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 and do all the stuff in terms of the Judiciary Council, but if the insurance industry is still going to be settling claims, which you think are somehow some of the more, most, the ones that you've decided to pull out and, and, and show, to the, show to this committee, what's the point? Uh, Deputy, my colleague gave those examples not to focus on the amount of the award, but to focus on the quantum of legal costs associated with the award. So I think that was the point of, of highlighting both the bodily injury award that was made and the plaintiff's costs associated with that award. I mean, uh, I think um, it is uh, important to remember that we are an insurance company and we are in the business of paying our claims. That is why people come to us and give us a premium. So it is our business to settle uh, claims at the uh, best and earliest possible opportunity for a fair amount of money for the re relative injury or 
uh, loss of property, and that is yeah. the business we are in. We, so we, we, had I think evidence, we had evidence, and I'll just get a finish on this here, just one point. We had, we had evidence before this committee from the marks, which FBD obviously ensure, and it was a claim, and we had a number of evidence, but the one I recall is a claim where somebody was injured by a horse in a field, and FBD insure, uh, settled with that claimant, and obviously the marks premium went up dramatically. The mark doesn't have a horse. They don't own the horse. That was nothing to do with them. And they argued with FBD not to settle the claim. But FBD take the easy way out, and I'm saying it to you, but it could be we've countless examples of other insurance which settle claims like that. So I can't talk about a specific uh, a case in a public forum, and I'm not going to. I will say about Mart's deputy that our loss ratio on Mart's is 160%. We are the only company willing to insure Marts. And if FBD was to withdraw on the basis of how much money it's losing insuring Marts, those Marts would no longer be viable. They wouldn't be able to open. And I don't think anybody in another business is going to charitably step in and offer to insure them. So uh, we remain the only market for Marts in the country and the reason we write them at a loss, Deputy, is because they are so important to half of our uh, customer base, the farming community and agri-related. And that's why we're writing Marts. There is enormous health and safety issues in the Mart, Mart environment and animals and where they're kept and how they're handled and employer liability that the mart and the co-ops that operate the marts uh, uh, are subject to and how they are held accountable for... I just want to go back to a figure that Mr Bradley gave us earlier. I think you said that, was it 19 million of um, <coughs> fraudulent <coughs> claims last year? Yes. And you also described that as, I think, 4.5, 4 to 4.5% of the premium. Of premium, that's right, yes. Um, and you would contend, I think, uh, that the level of fraudulent and exaggerated claims is one of three factors to consider in terms of quite high premiums facing people. It is. The, it is a factor. Um, but it needs to be put in perspective. It's 19 million out of a total claims cost that we have of, of, of 500 million. So it's important and a, and a factor. Um, a much bigger factor is the, the level of awards for, for soft tissue and whiplash. Okay, but just to stick with the 19 million for a moment and the okay. fraudulent claims, which are an important part of the narrative of the insurance industry. Could you remind me what your profits were last year? The, our profits last year were 89 million. Is 89 million four and a half times 19 million, give or take? Yes, uh, your maths is right. And so that's about 20% of a premium, your, your total premiums then? I, I think it's would, would, you, would, you, would you say it's fair to say that profits and the extortion of profits made by the insurance companies is a substantially greater contributor to the very high levels of premium than fraudulent claims? No, no, I wouldn't. Um, I think you know, we need to look at profit. We need to look at profitability over a period of years, and last year was 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 a very was a very strong year. Um, on average, I said the last five years profitability that we made was was about 30, 38 million per year. Um, that is the level of profitability that's needed for our shareholder to want to continue to operate in this marketplace. But say last year, your, your profits made up about 20% of your total premiums, whereas what you describe as fraudulent claims no, made up about 4 to 4.5%. Four our, our total premiums last year was 770 million. Uh -huh. You described 19 million as 4 to 4.5%, four and, and so therefore doing the maths yeah. upwards, you end up with close to 20% of your total costs, of your total premiums. So why, when you mentioned the, the three factors, and I think... Um, Sorry, that was, Mr. McGrath had three factors, and I think you also have, have three factors. What, why don't you mention the very high rates of profits in the company that is being a contributing factor? I, th I think, um, you know, I as I mentioned in my statement, when we look at the motor and liability markets, 
over the last number of years, from 2013 onwards. The Irish insurance industry paid out £1.1 billion more than they took in premiums. So I don't think the market can be characterised as one where there's been excessive profit. There's been, there's been a large number, there's been some very large losses, and some companies forced, forced in, into liquidation as a result. So I don't think this is a market where profitability is excessive. Um, when you look over a reasonable period of time. Okay, but let's look over a reasonable period of time. For example, the central bank figures. It's, it's accurate that central bank figures would indicate that from 2002, now you have a total profit for, insu for insurance companies operating in Ireland of over 3 billion euros since 2002. Isn't that the case? The, the total market profitability, I think, um, I don't have the number to hand. Um, I'm fairly certain that that's the, the figure. We, we used it, for example, in the report that we produced. At that stage, it was £2.8 from the central bank. But since then, obviously, you've had a couple of years of, of good profitability, so you're over the, the £3 billion mark. That's a healthy enough profit, no? Well, I, you know, what we, the, prof, the profit margin that we aim for is €5 Euros for, for, for every 100 that we take in from customers. Um, you know, and... If that three billion hadn't been gone in, in profit to shareholders over, since 2002, that would have resulted in a collective reduction in premiums of about three billion euros, wouldn't it? It's a, it's a, the, the, the profits that people pay for in their premium, they don't get any benefit from it, do they? Um, well, I think in any market, if you want companies to compete and continue, they need to make a profit. Our shareholders would expect us to make a return from this market. Mm -hmm. if, the, if, the, if it's a market where there's no profitability, you will have less and less companies wanting to compete and bigger, bigger problems around, around supply. So I think, we have, I think I would distinguish between the profit margin that's reasonable to reflect the investment we have in this marketplace. I don't think we have excessive profits. That, that's if you accept that the insurance industry has to be run on a for-profit rather than a non-profit uh, basis. That's the, the premise, of it, course, it, you're a private company, is. of course. But to, to follow that logic, your, your shareholders expect you to make a profit. Therefore, if um, cost of claims were to be reduced, wouldn't you be under some pressure from your shareholders to see that a portion of that reduction in claims goes in increased profits? I think it's important that we offer value to our customers um, you know, uh, if you take if you take if you take the uh, motor insurance, um, the average renewal price that a customer is paying this month is seven percent less than paying this time last year. So when we see a small reduction in claims frequency, we because it's a competitive marketplace with over 33 companies competing, we we we, we adjust our prices. But if, we, if if you could see that a large portion of um, a reduction in the cost of claims could go to profits. You would, wouldn't you? That's how a company operates. You operate but, uh, to maximise your profits. Partly, but partly to, to invest for the future. So you know, we, are, we are using some of the profit we've made mm -hmm. to, develop, we've, to develop into new sectors of the market, to, on new systems, mm -hmm. on, 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 on premises and infrastructure. So we have to make a, a profit to support the ongoing success of our business. And the market, because it's, it's a small market with a lot of players, is very competitive. And, and we will make, uh, if, if margins were excessive, more companies would come in. And, uh, well, I mean, we had some Dr. Cyril Rue in from the central bank during our hearings, and he described that as, a, as an act of faith that we have to have, it's, it's faith in the markets that a high rate of profits will result in more entering and so on. But it, it's not the case, is it, that there is an automatic correlation between cost of claims going down and premiums going down because there's an intermediate factor there, which is the level of profits that the companies choose it, to take. It, it is a factor, uh, sure, but I, but I go back to something I said earlier, that when the payout was introduced you know, back, back in the early 2000s, there was a 41% reduction in premiums. So clearly when there was a major change previously to the, to, uh, uh, which reduced the cost of claims, that, that fed through to customers. And, and it'll, it'll happen again. Maybe just to, to allow Mr McGrath and Ms Muldoon a, a chance. I mean, I mean, let me just pose it generally and feel free to respond. But I think that um, the insurance company, companies have a very deliberately crafted narrative about why people face such outrageously high 
premiums. And that narrative is about fraudulent claims, excessive claims, too high claims. And what is always left out of the narrative, not coincidentally, I would argue, is profits. And the very substantial profits made by the insurance company over an extended period of time, and I accept that it's an industry whereby it goes up and down, but over the last couple of decades, very substantial profits have been made by the insurance company. That's a significant contributing factor, which you don't like to mention. Isn't that the case? Uh, no, I disagree. I think, as I say, we, we in Allianz price to a margin of 6%. Um, that is a target that Allianz uh, operates right across the globe in the 80 markets worldwide that it operates in. So they don't ask any different uh, level of profitability to the Irish market than they do uh, in, in China, in the US, in Mexico, uh, in Germany itself, or, or anywhere else. Um, that, it, we believe, is a fair level of profit and one that is required to, com to remain a sustainable insurance company that remains solvent uh, and, and a run on a, a very fair and balanced way in the longer term. We've had many examples in this market of companies who have taken uh, more maverick approaches uh, and have cost uh, the Irish businesses and consumers many, many millions uh, and we're still paying for most of them uh, in the form of levies. Um, in relation to passing on um, savings from, from reduction in claim costs, I will re reiterate that we will pass on any reduction in costs uh, in our premiums. Um, I think this market is really competitive. You won't take any of it in profits? No, we have a target level of profitability and we will adjust our pricing based on that. So if claim costs come down, that's it. I mean, basically insurance companies need capital to make sure they're here for the long term. Shareholders need a return on that capital. Um, so the, that return doesn't change. And that's what we price to. So if the claims come down, they get passed on to customers. And as Phil pa pa um, Bradley from AXA pointed out, that's exactly what the industry did the last time there were reforms. I think when you look at it realistically, as I say, there's eight big companies um, have a very significant presence here in this market. But there are many more operating through brokers uh, and through freedom of services. If we didn't pass on those pr um, pricing reductions, we would lose business and very quickly um, because we would be open to other people to come in and, and to price to the lower levels and we would lose business. We're not in the, in, in the business of shrinking to greatness in Allianz. We want to grow our business and we want to grow it sustainably uh, for the long term. So again, those things will be passed on um, and it's not a leap of faith to think that the market would, would bring on capacity. That's exactly what happened uh, in the past uh, decade or 15 years you speak about. Uh, lots of that capacity has been described as uh, naive capacity and has come here on a um, freedom of services basis, but many of those companies came in and priced below cost and had drove prices down to a level that was unsustainable, which was a factor in where this crisis began. Ms. Uh, yeah, I don't have much to add, Deputy, other than it feels like I'd have to amount to defence of capitalism. I mean, it is, a, uh, it is a business. It seeks to make a profit. The only alternative to that is the state uh, uh, provision of insurance. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I suppose we'd have to go nine rounds on whether the state could be uh, as efficient as a privately run business that was seeking to make a profit and a return for its shareholders. So in the absence of a state-run system and uh, the inefficiencies that a state-run system would be likely to bring with it, we have a heavily competed uh, um, capitalist-based, free market-based uh, system where we are making modest uh, return on equity to reward our shareholders who and our shares are for sale every day in the public markets and uh, they're putting their money at risk. I, I believe that uh, we are heavily competed in the farm sector. It's the sector we know best, so I apologise for using it as an example again, but we're heavily competed. We have heard from uh, our, my French uh, colleague uh, that he has entered the farm market. There are others uh, competing, the Swiss and the, and the British as well. And um, if we are charging a price that's unsustainable, I'm sure my German colleagues will join us. So it is a heavily competed uh, market and the market sets the price and if you are inefficient or if you're not making a profit then you're uh, out of business and that's the system we're in. Thanks a lot. Thanks, sir. Uh, Senator Palmer Welch. Uh,
Cahirlik, uh, and thank you for coming before us today. I suppose I want to commend you for that in the first instance because there are others who we would like to have here who aren't here. Um, I think the most useful thing from today is the fact of taking the, the headlines of that all of the causation is on fraud. Because if you walk outside the gate here today and you see somebody commit a crime, any of you, see somebody commit a crime, it could be an assault or whatever it is, you're going to report that to the Gardaí, obviously. So what makes insurance fraud any different? And we see from the numbers um, that fraud is, is just a minute amount, minute amount in terms of it. So we need to take it off the table because we need transparency. We have been working on this now, Kerlick, what, for about three years? in terms to get to the bottom of things, get to transparency. And the messages we get all the time, depending on who's before us, is, oh, don't look here, we need you to look there. And I do think that the media have a role to play in this as well, in terms of the headline figures, in investigating and drilling down, like my colleague Pierce Doherty did this morning, uh, in terms of having actual facts, not headline figures on it. So I think this morning has been a useful session. And I agree with you, uh, Ms Muldoon, when you say about the profits, and there's nothing whatsoever wrong with any company making a profit. That's what companies do, you prof profit maximisation. No problem whatsoever. But I do think you have to have cognizance of the very many businesses, very many businesses, some of them operating for generations, that the insurance industry have pushed out of business and the mental stress and the financial stress that these small businesses have had to go through because of the huge premiums. Now, it's not the only contributing factor, but because of the huge premiums that have been imposed upon them by government in the first instance, because obviously it's compulsory to have insurance, and then by insurance companies say, pay up this amount without any explanation as to why they have to pay up the amount. We have said right from the beginning in terms of the industry and the mistakes of the industry and then the consumers being the collateral damage. But I do think in terms of looking at the profits, if you're looking at, I think it's about 50%, it would show about 50% profit. People don't expect to get 50% increase in their wages in one year. I, I, I think it's, it's too much and too soon and it's not reflected in the premiums. Now, I, am, I do welcome the fact that you say that when we look at the profits for next year, that that will be directly reflected in the reduction in insurance premiums. But I want to ask you about the deferred tax assets, I suppose, for each of you. How much can you write down um, in those profits? So I just want to get to the bottom of how much actual tax you pay on, on the profits that you make. So just in the deferred assets, maybe, how much can you write off in terms of tax? Sorry, I, I don't have, in terms of the, the write-off, I don't know, but I know in, in uh, 2017 and 18, Allianz paid uh, under 30 million profits. Um, how much? I think 4 million of yeah. corporation tax, which is almost 12.5%. So we pay a full level of tax. So you don't have any deferred assets then? You don't have any deferred uh, tax uh, assets, do you? No. So, no. so to make up for losses in previous years, you don't no. have? It's an unusual situation. Maybe you could just confirm that to the committee. You can, uh, yeah. Um, afterwards. And for FBD, in terms of deferred assets? We made very significant losses, as I pointed out mm. in my opening remarks. So uh, we would have um, some level of deferred uh, tax asset from those losses, yes. What's that? Do you know what the deferred assets are? I haven't, I haven't it in front of me. Yeah, maybe you could again uh, yeah, uh, let no us problem, know as a committee yeah. in, in, yeah, in how no much. We just, we just want to get an honest... All of our God. financial information, our full P&L and balance sheet yeah. is published on our website. Mm. We're a publicly quoted company, yeah. so our, our, uh, all of our information is publicly available. There is nothing that is not okay. available. So, so, yeah, so let's just have a... Just in terms of the marts, I just want to take you to the marts for one second. Um, how many claims have been made by marts in the last year, both in terms of the number of claims and the payouts? 
So we do not publicly disclose the quantum of premium on, uh, on Marts. It's a heavily loss-making sector, and I've given you the loss ratio. So we're paying out a euro and 60 for every euro in premium we collect. And we are the, we are the, only, uh, we are the only Mart insurer in, in No, the and I know that you've said that, and I find that interesting. But just in terms of the number of claims, I think, why... Why would we not know the number of claims that have been made by Mar by in, in a Mart situation? Just to be able to, and it's for your own, God, it's with your own reputation, just to be able to have confidence in what you're saying. Well, we're, we have great confidence in what we're saying. We've worked mm. very uh, we closely with ICOS to develop yeah. a health and safety mm. approach in Mart. Right. We've offered... Yeah. We've offered yeah. uh, um, price um, guarantees to any mart that will work yeah. within the confines mm. of the health and safety standards mm. Mm. that we have brought out with ICOS, uh, which is an umbrella, you will know, right. an umbrella cooperative yeah. uh, uh, umbrella, and most yeah. of the marts are members of ICOS. Yeah. So we would be very happy that we are on the right trajectory yeah. with the marts, yeah. but they are still heavily loss-making, and they, mm. they face very particular mm. I issues around yeah. animals and, and animal management. Yeah, that's right and that's what because I'm really interested in figures um, that's why I want to see because of the changes that have been made in relation to CCTV and other health and safety measures within the marts and there's been investments made <coughs> I want to be able to see that the number of claims have been reduced the number of certainly of false claims in any sense have been reduced and that's why I'm asking you for those figures you know I'd like to see that okay in 2015 it was this number of claims to this value because all of these interventions have been put in place that they're effective I want to know they're effective yeah, in reducing uh, and, premiums. And, and indeed uh, Senator we're very much on the same page on that yeah. given that we're losing money on them at the moment uh, I mean you will appreciate that no individual Mart would thank us if I gave you individual figures I'd, on them I, I can the ask my Mart my colleague uh, Ms Tobin to comment further in terms yeah. of our underwriting acceptance criteria yeah. and, and where, we're, where we're going in health and safety. Uh, no, I just want the figures. I just want well, the figures to be able to... You see, the data, the data, the data has been the problem here since we started this. Yeah. The, the raw data, the raw data. FBD we can analyze is a it ourselves. public company. All of our data yeah. is published in a fully transparent way. We have more data out so there than any So yet you can't tell me the number of claims made from Marts. I compete against the people that I'm sitting at this table yeah. with. I already have more data out there than any other company. So uh, No, I just want I just want the raw figures. I want I really just want to be able to know that the interventions are working. I'm not disputing what you're saying. I want to know it myself. Otherwise, we're all busy fools. And people are making investment in marts and it's not being reflected. Well, no, I, we would be, we, I will ask my colleague to comment, but we would be happy that we are on the right trajectory with the marts. Yeah. Well, the marts aren't happy because their premiums no, they, aren't they coming down. They feel they're paying too much. Absolutely. Yes, because they're not Absolutely. coming down. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're happy. No, we're, I what said we were happy we were on the right, we were taking a, traveling the right path and we've worked very closely with ICOS to help and we've invested in health and safety officers okay, and we've given yeah, price guarantees and, and we, yeah. we're working very closely. I'm not happy that uh, the situation yeah. is what it is. Okay. It's a very difficult situation. Okay. I'm going to move on from the marts because I can see that I'm not really going to get anywhere here in terms of raw data. So I want to ask you the other thing around Somebody makes a claim. You're doing, you do, and I can get what you're saying, you do part of the investigation because you don't want going to the Gardaí for every bit and pieces. The God knows the Gardaí have enough to do. But why don't you go back to the policy holder and check very simple things with them? Why don't you go back to the policy holder and say, look, we're thinking of doing a payout based on A, B, C, and D. They are often the main witness that are there on the day. Why isn't there contact between the policyholder who's going, whose premium is going to escalate as a result of the decision you're going to make? Why don't you just, as, as par for the course, go back to save yourselves money as well as the policyholder? Just maybe, maybe Mr. McGrath. I, I think that's exactly what does happen. Uh, I know in no. our case we speak no. and we'll get evidence we, we don't accept a claim from a third party without checking with the policyholder that the incident has taken place uh, and to get a, a, an account of what's happened. Um, so I'm not sure what 
No, your no, no, that's based not on? our experience at all, at all, at all. At all, at all, at all. And I've had personal experience of this. Not at all. That, is, that does not happen, I can tell you. Well, I tell you, in terms it of Alliance... It does not happen, uh, and going back to the policyholder to say how much has been paid out from their um, in policy holder. In terms of checking out whether the claim has happened uh, and, and the, the account of it, we do check with the policyholder. In terms of, of um, going back to in advance and saying this is what the settlement is, no, we don't. Um, but at that stage, the claim has gone through the PIAB or is going through the courts um, and, is, and, and is being pursued, and that's... But that's, that's the normal, that's the normal way the industry operates. Yeah, but, but, but it, isn't, it isn't normal if, 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 a, if your decision is going to be, is going to have such a, an impact on my premium. Okay, at the beginning you say, okay, you establish that an accident has happened or that an incident has happened. Well, that's it then. There's no more engagement with the policyholder. No, no, no. To say this that is the decision we're thinking of making based on what we have in front of us. Is there anything further that you could add to that or any of this that you dispute? No, because it, uh, from our point we have established the facts of what has, ha has or hasn't happened and the level of settlement or the quantity of, uh, of that is, is not something I think the insured can, can give us any assistance in. Um, but how do you know if you don't ask? Well, because if, if a whiplash has been uh, claimed and has been proven and the medical records have been there, um, we have books of quantum already, we have the experience of our own, you know, we have 650 people in Allianz, they're very experienced and very qualified and very professional. They know what these claims cost, they're dealing with them on a day in, day out but basis. But there could be contributing so, factors in terms of the other person and the other person's liability as well around. We, we would have gathered that information at the start. Yeah, I'd put it that... Uh, that you need to be consulting with the policy holder throughout. If you're it's, making a statement, a, it might be two years. It's a fact that, you know, we get back to over here, is that claim mm. costs are too high. Nobody ever feels they're at fault um, yeah. and, in, and that's in, why in I'm an accident. To, yeah. No one ever does. Mm. Uh, everyone thinks they're a good driver. You know, 90% of people think they're better than mm. average in driving, which is, mm. you know, um, impossible, mm. but that's the way it is. Uh, so nobody drive. ever thinks they're at fault. So the system no. is adversarial enough as it is. Yeah. Um, yeah. without making things yeah. even worse. Absolutely, in terms of keeping our customers up to date of what happens and the impact, that is something we, I think we do, and maybe we could get better at doing. Yeah. Um, but involving them in the settlement yeah. is not something. I don't think you have, a, you have enough um, contact with your customers in terms of that also. And I want to ask you just, uh, is there anything that's stopping you as a matter of routine from including a five-year schedule for customers on how their premium and claims have been dealt with? So to give customers a picture or, or over five years of the relationship to well, you on, and the, on the commercial business, that's probably uh, something that does happen, uh, definitely through businesses that, that's transacted through brokers. Um, so it, it depends on the type of business it is. Um, it, it wouldn't be in personal lines because, I mean, in, in your normal motor, personal motor household business, probably only one in ten policyholders has a claim in any one year. So for the vast bulk of people, yeah. they're, not, they're not going to have a claims yeah. history. Yeah. I so really we, do. I think, we, I think yeah. we would bring a lot of more administration into, into a system that's not, not, to no real uh, benefit. You need to consult with customers. On an, maybe just for yourselves on, on, uh, from FVD in terms of uh, checking with um, the policyholder. What is your policy on it? Before a premium is paid out against their, before a claim yeah, is paid yeah, out, yeah. I'll ask, I'll ask Jackie to take you through the process, but in general, uh, we do keep our customers informed. It is an adversarial system, so, uh, and we are well aware that many of our um, insureds uh, are upset at the level of awards that uh, end yeah. up being made and it is a difficult thing for us because there are customers but we also have to we also have to pay claims sometimes that will be uh, disputed very heavily I would also point out that in the case of employer liability uh, and, and that was in the letter as one of your areas of focus it is very difficult for uh, any employer to prove any sort of co cont contribution to the accident that because by the very nature of the fact that they have employed the person and they are on the premises that, and that the only reason that they are there is there to do their job that it is almost certainly going to be the employer's fault 
mm. no matter, uh, mm. no matter um, what mm. the circumstance of the accident was. I know. Just, just, get in again. To, just like to emphasise that we absolutely do very thorough investigations in any claim that's presented before us. Uh, we want to understand um, this, the um, circumstances, the uh, liability issues. We have a team of investigators who are out on the ground and investigate. They talk to all the parties involved, including, of course, um, our insured. Um, from a personal lines perspective, we absolutely write out to them when each, each claim is settled, giving them what, was, what, what, was, what the amount that was settled. In commercial businesses, um, um, by and large, we, we discuss it with the customers. It's really important that we keep those customers with us. There are customers. We want to keep them as our customers. And we also want to know, you know what, we're, what we're doing on their behalf in terms but of setting don't. their claims. So that's, that's, that's actually really, really important to us. But you don't. You see, you don't. That's the problem. Well, I'm, 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 I certainly um, I would t take issue with yeah. that, and I'd There's like to... There's huge payouts on people's premiums without them having where, any... Where the, issue, where the issue rises often for us is in discussions around the, um, the, the settlement quantum. Um, frankly, people are shocked, first of all, that they could be in any way liable, that they didn't do anything wrong, that they basically had a, a, a reasonable duty of, of care, uh, mm -hmm. and that they should, nothing should be paid, and then what we are paying is astronomical. And I'm afraid that whole discussion goes back into, well, you know, we have a lot of people, a lot of experience of the precedence and what's paid for, what type, what type of evidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's mm -hmm. certainly also interesting mm -hmm. sometimes when we have that conversation with people who say, look, it is, it is, it is and I, I agree lots of the time, it is really, really large payout amounts. And I, the conversation would go like, look, it, it's going to cost us... Um, you know, 100,000 in, 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 in a settlement. The fees, let's say 40%, can all be a lot higher, 70% lower, lower amounts. And we offer them the, the 150,000, say, do you want to take that risk on? None of them would take the risk on at that stage. Anyway, it really is, okay. it's, it's, what it's a frustration mm -hmm. with is the system. It's a system of high payouts and high costs of which nobody feels in, con in, in mm -hmm. control of. And I, I do feel the pain. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairman. Can I... Um, I read the conclusion of Ms Muldoon's uh, statement. She said, look at the enormous sums of money has been made by the legal profession about the injury awards. Look at the vested interests. And the one thing that comes to mind here, and it's, we've deliberated this a long time, it continues to amaze me that the insurance company are blaming the legal profession. The legal profession are blaming the insurance companies. And the only person who's in order is the, is the consumer. And we've been given a, a myriad of figures here. And I have to say, the, the insurance industry itself is part of that vested interest. Because when you look at the figures, um, there appears to be, they don't add up. So I suppose, just to, in the time I have, the companies we have here, we've Allianz, AXA, NFBD. What percentage of the market do each? I, I want to get an idea. What percentage of the market do each um, have of the Irish market? Could you just give me that figure very quickly? What, Mr. McGrath, um, Mr. Bradley, and Ms. Moore, what percentage of the Irish market do you have? FBD has, at an estimate, and it's very hard for one company to know for sure, a, between 8 and 10 percent. Total uh, market. And uh, uh, Mr. McGrath? 15%. And uh, Mr. Uh, Bradley? Well, 17.5% of the general insurance market. 17.5%. So you roughly have about uh, between you 27. You're not too far off 50% of the Irish market between you. The second thing I wanted to ask was um, that Allianz and AXA have both told us they're looking for roughly a margin. Uh, AXA looking at 5%, Allianz looking at 6% on the premiums. FPD, what do you look for in terms of um, a margin on the premiums? Uh, we, the guidance we give the capital markets annually is uh, that we, we aim to uh, deliver a combined operating ratio in the low 90s. And that will mean uh, that we meet a target return on equity in the low teens. So low teens. So on, on margins and premiums, you're looking that, at yeah, low 90s. So you're looking at what? So uh, 10 and 11 percent of a margin. No, no less. Uh, eight. Eight. Somewhere percent. around there. So you're slightly higher than the other two. 
And what was the profit that FPD made in 2018, Ms Muldoon? We were very proud to make 50 million after, a, a, as I have said. Is that, is that in 2018? Yes. And, and we paid a dividend of 50 cent per share. Okay. For and the first time in three on years. On average, the premiums you're charging between 07 and 18, have the regard the premiums have come down in all areas? So you might just quickly. So between general insurance and motor insurance, have, have your premiums fallen? You made a reference of 7% lower. Uh, someone made a reference. Of so could you just give me, have your premiums, do you believe the premiums you're charging customers of motor and general insurance have fallen between 70, 18 and 19, uh, 17 and 18? Um, I'll ask, uh, An average. Between 2017 and 2018, Maybe. and the premium, and current year. Uh, I would believe that premiums are coming down marginally at the moment. Mr. McGrath and Mr. Bradley? Um, again, in, in relation to past movement in, in the last year or two, I think our motor premiums have been relatively stable or slightly reduced. Um, and on businesses, it's very much sector specific. Some sectors are still. Um, receiving increases, others are stable. And Mr Bradley? Um, home insurance stable, we have a small player on the kind of, in the commercial SME area. Um, in motor, as I mentioned earlier, renewal premiums now are 7% lower than they were this time last year. So would it be fair to say then that the motor insurance premiums have actually come down and we'll say general insurance has more or less stayed stable, would that be correct? <coughs> okay. Now, but at the same time, with that, your profits in 18 were 37 million valiance, which was 7.4% of a margin. AXO was 11.56%, uh, which was 89 million and 770 million of premiums. What was the premiums written by, by FPD in 2018? 372 How much? Mil 372 million. So you would have made a profit of 50 million. What was your, your margin on 50 million there? Our combined ratio was 89.1%. No, no, I'm, I'm more interested in, in, the, in the net margin on the premium. So, so uh, I, I'm looking at it. No, uh, uh, that's 10.9. So that would be 50 divided by 372. So that's 13.4% of a margin, right? Now, that's well above. So for AXA, you look for a margin of 6%, you made 7.4, so Alliance rather. AXA, you look for a margin of 5%, you're looking at nearly double that, 11.56. In FPD, you're looking for a margin of 8%, and you have 13.4%. So the question I ask is... FPD is 10.9, Deputy. Well, I'm looking at 270 million of premiums written with a net profit of 50 million. So I'm looking at... Uh, 50 divided by 270 is about 13.4 percent. The question I'm posing is, if you're talking about uh, did you look for t to make margins of uh, Alliance uh, 6 percent, AXA 5 percent and FPD about 8 percent, you've made well above those margins in 2018. Why wasn't, wasn't the, the A the, margin, the, the profit, some element of the profit above the, the margin you look for, pass back to reduce premiums. You can't just blame it on uh, legal fees, okay, and, and the fraudulent aspect as well. So you need to explain to me, to the ordinary person out there, you're profitable. Yes, I believe insurance companies have to make a profit, okay, but it can't be fleecing the customer. And the the question is for us, we, we have a body of work to do here, it's not personal here, this is an issue we have had the legal profession in, I believe their fees are excessive. Uh, I also believe that within the insurance company, and we are coming here looking at figures on the day, I haven't had hours to prepare, but certainly when you look at the figures in stark terms, right, you're profitable. In fact, I could say you're super profitable in 2018. You're well above the margin you're required to, to make. So why was that uh, increased profit in some element not passed back to the consumer? You might just deal with... I have limited time, so I am being specific uh, for a reason, because I think it's all about facts. So the facts are the insurance industry is here before us today. We have to probe the figures. And the figures are that you're profitable, and you're profitable above 
the margins that she required to make. AXA Alliance will say uh, roughly about your 7.4 percent, you look for 6 percent, you made 37 million Alliance. AXA 89 million, you have 11.5, 6 percent of a margin, you look for 6 percent. And FBD, sorry, 5 percent rather for AXA. FBD looks for 8 percent and you have 13.4 percent, which is well above that, 50 million. So can you just deal with that specific point? Not about, we'll say, blaming other elements, insurance and fraud, but specifically the area to achieve direct responsibility and you've control over. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bradley McGrath. That's the margin. Yes. The margins are well up. The margin that you say you need to be able to operate in, the actual margins are well above that figure. Um, can I start? Yeah. Yes, Mr. Um, Bradley. Uh, firstly, I think it's important, <coughs> certainly last year the margins were better than they've been historically, but it's important to look over a period of time, not just one year. And if we look over five years, then uh, we haven't achieved our target margins. Secondly, I suppose from Max's perspective, we're primarily a motor insurer. Prices have come down 7%. So we, you do see that margin flowing back to the customers. Um, you're still making above the margin that you look to make, which is 5%. In an individual year, you might, but over a period of time, that's not the case. But that, but with your respect, Mr. Bradley, right? I accept that point, right? However, however, against the backdrop, against the backdrop where we have, we see premiums being quoted for older people, younger people, at exorbitant rates, 1,000, 2,000 euros, right? The question then, we, we have to ask the question, why? Yeah. Well, the, the answer is the, kind of, the margins were better last year and prices are now coming down. Um, How much do you anticipate they'll come down further well, I, over I the course of 2019? I don't think I can talk about future price changes, but I can talk about what's happened so far to June and they've come down 7% so far to June. And do you anticipate they'll come down further in the coming... We'll see. I mean, the, other, the other statistics on the market for motor insurance are the CS, CSO statistics, and they show that motor insurance costs have come down 21% over the last... Over I'm the not last denying they're coming years. down, but I believe they probably should have come down at a higher rate. That's an observation, and yeah. you're, it's, it's your business, but I have to ask the question. Yeah. Mr. McGrath. First of all, to be, to be clear, uh, whilst there was a lot of talk about um, fraud and everything else here today, the, we again reiterate the single biggest problem and issue is level of, of awards, by far. Um, and not talking about legal costs or anything else, I think a lot of those issues will be helped or mitigated by bringing down claim costs. Book a quantum. But that's, but that's the biggest issue. Book a quantum. As I said, we price to a, a, a target level of 6%. We were very close to it in 2018. It's not an exact science, as we say. We have to set well, up. Well, you are close to it, above the line rather than below have, the line. But if you look back another couple of years, uh, uh, Senator, you would see that we were below the line uh, on it as well. So we continuously re recalibrate our pricing depending on the trends we see on claims. So that's a, that's a process that goes on uh, <coughs> quarterly uh, within Alliance. Yeah. Uh, our prices are also um, are being reduced where, where we can, and as I say, that that process is continuous. There is a lag between insurance profits emerging in the accounts and what we have to price for as well. But it's a continuous process and lower claims costs are reflected in lower well, premiums. Would it be fair to say, Mr McGrath, that operating in the insurance market in Ireland at the moment is a profitable business? Uh, at the moment, it's a profitable business, as it hasn't always been in the most recent past, as you've seen. But as, as, and, and as it, we stand now? As it stands now, the market is, looks to be in a profitable position. We think it's, I would, from our assessment, the market is at a level that probably is, is there a level of profitability it needs to have uh, to be sustainable in the long run. And it's a level of profitability uh, that we see across markets right across the world as part of the Alliance Group. Do you believe you have any role to play in the fact that premiums are so high even at this point in time? Until claims costs come down, premiums have to reflect the level of, of claims that's in the market at the moment. So whilst we absolutely uh, uh, um, I want to help here and be part of the solution, uh, and we absolutely 
delighted of, of the process uh, where the committee is going in terms of the Book of Quantum and the reforms for the Judicial Commission. Uh, absolutely the right way to go. But until those reforms are actually implemented, you know, and uh, Senator Lawler here, his civil liabilities capping, uh, the general damages capping bill as well, until those are implemented and we see the evidence, we have to price to the level of claims that are currently there. Well done. I yeah, don't have much, uh, much to add. We did make a profit last year. We uh, paid a dividend for the first time in three years. Uh, we uh, would believe, um, without getting into, this is what makes insurance difficult, this technical uh, issue of what you're pricing at versus the emergence of the profit does make it, and it's why we're all here, I guess. So um, we... Um, uh, have adjusted. We're fiercely competitive uh, at the moment um, in our core areas and uh, our average premiums in, in those areas are, are down. I, I don't know if my colleague uh, um, Ms Tobin wants to comment further on pricing. Um, not a whole lot to add um, on the pricing I suppose. Um, when, when we talked the numbers for um, 2018 as well, we would have, um, I suppose, what we would have seen as a, as a fairly benign year when it came to weather, um, notwithstanding Storm, Storm Emma actually happened, but the management of it probably um, helped in terms of the overall claims costs and otherwise would have been. I think the other part in just, um, I suppose, looking forward at the costs, um, uh, to, to kind of keep in mind as well, as we're talking a lot about injury, um, mm. there's not, inflation at the level um, in the property space as there is has been in the injury space but there is inflation there um, and I suppose that's Define inflation, what do you mean? Um, so increased costs of um, labour for rebuild on property, um, increased costs for parts for replacement on newer cars um, so I think like those factors are taken into account as well when we take a look at the pricing um, when we're setting it at the outset of a policy. I just two final questions. Can you Looking at 100 uh, premium taken in, and maybe to go through, because um, certainly I think, uh, Mr. McGrath, you had started that of 100 euro premium that comes in, you, roughly about 94% of that is paid out, right? Yes. Okay. Now, can you break that down in terms of claims, uh, injury, the claims, the awards, plus we'll say the breakdown of legal fees? Can you give a breakdown of that? I just want to see, we, we speak about it in the abstract, I'd like to see the makeup. So of the 100 euros, 94 is paid out. What's that 94% made up of? Well, the biggest part is, is, is claims. In how total, much is that? Uh, which is 67%. And how much of that is broken down between the award and legal fees? Um, if you give me, can I just finish the rest of the, and I'll get back to breaking yeah. that down further. Um, so there's another 10% goes in commissions. Yeah. Um, there's another 13% goes in our own costs of running the, the, the operation here, overheads, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's a 4% reinsurance cost. Reinsurance, okay. So can you just go back to two thirds of the costs is made up by claims? Yeah. What's the breakdown between uh, the awards and legal fees? Um, legal fees is, I think, 30%. I have 30%. 30% 30 of the, of, on, on the injury side. So, 30, so 37% is the award and 30% is legal fees. Well, so just on, on the 67%, if you want to split that out, it's 42% goes to damage and 58% goes to injury. 42% damage cl claims. Yeah, so that could be uh, property, commercial, and, and 58. 58 is is injury cost. And can I just go back because I'm more interested? Am I correct in saying that of the 67%, 37% is in terms of awards, and 30% is legal costs? I, I want to I want to compare what the figures Mr. McMahon has given us. So I want to see that of the awards that are paid out in, we'll say, personal injury cases, the breakdown between the awards and legal fees. Well, of, of that 58%, which goes to injury, yeah. uh, we, our, our estimate is about 80% of that goes in legal costs, and, and other costs, such as... 80% and, oh, and how much of that is the... Only 20% is the award? No, 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 sorry, 30% of the 58%, so you've got to multiply them out. 30% of the 58% yeah. is... Legal fees. Legal fees and, and medical fees and engineering And that fees means 28% or... is the award? No, no, sorry. I, I'm trying to find out yeah. of what, if, if you pay out a personal injury, what percentage of that goes to the award 
compensation and what percentage is legal fees? Seventy percent goes to paying the, the injury. Seventy percent of the fifty-eight percent goes to pay the injury. And thirty percent of, of the fifty-eight goes to pay costs. Okay, legal fees. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Bradley. Um, so, if for every hundred euros, between sixty-five and seventy goes to pay claims. Thirteen goes for our own internal expenses. Yeah. About seven in the in commission to yeah. intermediaries. Yeah. There's a couple of percent there for levies. Yeah. And about three percent on reinsurance. And of of the sixty-five to seventy percent, can you just on the personal injury side, what percentage of that? Because we'll say seventy percent. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, McGrath has said for Alliance and about 30% goes in legal fees. What's your breakdown in personal injury? Personal injury, the breakdown would be similar. Obviously, some claims go, we pay. Or well, roughly 70 30. Uh, yes, roughly. Uh, some goes for the MIBI, some for damage claims. But when we look at injury claims, okay. it's 70 uh, 30. And can I come back finally to FPD? AXA have stated that uh, both AXA and Alliance are saying they get about 5,000 personal injury claims each a year. How many personal injury claims would you settle a year, Mr. Would you get in, Mr. McMahon? It's not that much. Okay. And based on the figures, can we get a breakdown of the 100 euro premium? The breakdown of that between um, how much is paid out? So, in your case, of the 100 euro, 95% is paid out, Mr. Bradley. And of, of your 100 euro, how much is paid out, um, Ms. Muldoon? Current year, uh, 2018, 89. 89% is paid out, and the make-up of that 89%? 25% uh, uh, goes to running the company and our branch network, yeah. and sell we don't pay commissions. Yeah, so it's, it's, equ so, it's equivalent, yeah. Yeah, and then the 65 is um, uh, for all claims, including Storm Emma. And, and what's, 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 the, what's the breakdown on the personal injury side between the, the, legal, the, the claims at the awards and the legal costs? We think it's slightly higher than 30 per cent. So what we do you were think it is? 35 to 40. Uh, I can tell you that we paid 150, over 150 million in the last five years in plaintiff costs, legal costs. I accept that. Now, looking at that, and this is going back, Mr. McMahon, I want to be fair, right? But I just want to ask you, have you been selective in what you've picked? Because you've picked four claims. One a stress claim, which was 60,000 settlements, 73,000 costs, which was 55% of the overall payout was in legal costs. The second one was a car park injury, uh, and you said 15,500 15, of, of a claim, 16,220 of legal costs, which is 51% overall. Then you, the next one was a finger injury, um, uh, the 12,500 of a claim, and 20,477 20, in legal costs, which is 62% overall. Your final one then was an equine-related one, which was 81,313 of a claim, 108,918 of costs, which is 58%. So the first one, the stress one, was 133,400. 55% of that was legal costs, 70,460,000 the claim. The next one was a car park, 31,720. 155 was, was a claim, 16,220 was legal costs, 51%. And the next one was a finger, 32,977 total, uh, 12,500 of, of a claim, 24,77 of legal costs, 62%. And finally, 190,231 of an equine related injury. 108,918 of uh, legal costs and 81,313. It's 58%. So that doesn't equate with Ms Muldoon's figure of, which appears to be consistent with both AXA and Alliance, of roughly about 70% of awards and 30% of legal costs. So you might comment on that. Um, I think the, um, and, and, and the last time I was with this committee as well, the... And you might, in, in your response, go through those four cases you've, you've made that which of those are, were in court and which were settlements out of court? My main purpose here, um, I'm probably a bit direct, but my main purpose is I want to get to the truth here. And the problem is, is that 
we are led to believe from the insurance company it's all about legal costs and we're led to believe from the legal uh, uh, profession it's all about insurance costs. And I think the truth is somewhere in between. So I, I, I have said, and I would say again, this is a complex issue. I think I agree with you, Senator. Well done. When people use the word complex so issue, it's normally a way they don't want to. I, well, bottom, you're large companies. You have access to data yes. that we do not have access and that's to. What I, and you analyse, and you have actuaries employed to look at, at projections and costings. So don't come I to me and say it's complex. No, I don't. Uh, yeah, but I, don't come in here <laughs> and say an issue is complex. This, this, the, the facts are there. So okay, I need so you to explain I, the inconsistencies. Uh, yeah. 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 So I did not uh, intend yeah. to irritate you, Senator. I, what well, you didn't irritate me. I just want to get uh, to the facts. So, so what uh, I w want, want to say is, is that there's, an, it's, um, there's a lot of different things going on here. And uh, Jackie has given a few examples. And we have they given were selective, Ms. Muldoon. They were selective. They, they are selective. Yeah. Yes, they're to make a point. We reiterate the legal costs are a significant component, but our central message, no more than Alliances, is FBD is saying bodily injury awards, particularly soft tissue injuries, the awards in the courts are too high. That's our central message. We gave some selective examples to demonstrate what's going on with legal and medical costs as well. But I think I just want to make that point. Our central message remains the best way to lower insurance costs is to lower bodily injury awards. Can I finish on this point? Can I ask the companies that uh, will say Vax Alliance and FBD? If the book of quantum comes back with reduced in terms of the awards that can, uh, can be offered under personal injury claims, do you give a guarantee that you reduce your premium? And secondly, we can't have a situation where the book of quantum is revised. The insurance companies under the, 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 the cloak of awaiting the book of quantum that they can make super profits of hard pressed consumers. So you just deal with that very quick point. The, the, the book of quantum and not to be making any element of super profit until the book of quantum is revised. I, I, can, um, I believe that the Irish insurance market is very, very heavily competed. I can say without doubt that if the cost of input is lowered and the main cost component in our input in insurance terms is the cost of bodily injury claims, if the cost of bodily injury claims comes down, the cost of insuring with FBD, and we want more customers, will come down to. Thanks, Mr. McGrath, Mr. Bradley. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. Can I, can I, I just, yeah, yeah, just, I just want a commitment from board. I think to be, for consistency, just Mr. Mr. McGrath, Mr. Bradley. Very as, quick. as I've said, uh, Senator, earlier in, in, in our opening statement, uh, Alliance are committed to, to reducing the cost uh, insurance if the cost of claims comes down. And Mr. Bradley, finally. Yeah, if, if the cost of claims come down, the cost of insurance will come down. Uh, make that commitment for Axel. Thank you. Yes, sir, I have a few brief questions. Uh, we had all the groups in here uh, over the last uh, three years, and uh, there was certain allegations made that, that uh, cartels existed in the insurance business. Would any of you have a view on that? I didn't hear anybody refuting it, but so you might get an opportunity today to refute that there's no, certainly no cartels operating within the insurance business. I, I can sort of say from, from any point of view, I've never seen any such cartel type activity. Um, the industry has been investigated I think, now three times by the Competition Authority and uh, there's never been any finding of any cartel type operations uh, in, in the business. It, it's a very competitive market that is evidenced by the, the uh, competitions out there and the uh, variation in pricing you can get because it's We had the haulage industry in here and uh, they had to, uh, in lots of cases, had to go to the UK to get uh, insurance for some of their lorries, uh, which was um, very sad to say the least. Mr Bradley. There's, there's certainly no cartel operating. Um, it's a competitive industry um, which over a number of years, certainly back to 15, 16, 17, was loss making. And uh, I've seen no evidence for uh, it's a competitive market without, without, without a cartel. There certainly are, um, and the competitiveness of this market can be seen, that if local companies 
The numbers of local companies aren't, aren't able to offer a competitive price. People have access to the international markets and London to, 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 to access, access um, premiums and capacity. Uh, in the insurance industry, every year, I suppose the companies evaluate how much it's going to cost, maybe project how much it's going to cost to run the following year. And that's based, I suppose, on the number of claims they have and the yeah. amount of money that has to be paid out. Do you raise the premiums then on everybody or reduce them according to whatever your projections would be? We do. We, we make a forecast on what we think the cost of claims is going to be. I mean, the challenge we have as an industry is that we charge the premium today and we won't really know how profitable this year has been for three, three to four years. Yeah. But, but we make assumptions of what we think the cost of claims how it will change and cost that into our premiums. But, but the people that had claims against them, they, you really hammered those people. And I have a few cases in my constituency where people had to go out of business because of the, the rising cost of the insurance premium. But those people were, were, may have been no fault of their own at all. But the industry, as well as maybe putting a premium on people, raising the premium on people across the industry, they really hammered the people where the claims took place as well. Well, certainly a premium will reflect the claims history um, and if you have any individual cases you'd like, you'd like to, be look, to look at, I'm, I certainly do that, um, but uh, premiums reflect, as, as with somebody with a very good claims history expects a lower premium, people with a poor claims history usually pay more, particularly if there's, if there's, if there's frequent claims rather than just a kind of one-off incident. So the person that has uh, had claims, uh, well, I said that they're being hammered, they're also getting an, uh, um, an annual increase from every, everybody else's claims as well, you know. Wouldn't that be the case? Well, we'd have some general pricing principles, and then we would price based on an individual risk. So there are two elements. Do you refuse claims? Does the industry refuse, or refuse people to insure people? Um, different companies have their own acceptance criteria. Um, we have a very wide acceptance criteria and we will provide a quote for motor insurance for well over 90% of the market. So no, no, none of the companies that are here today uh, refuse premium or refuse to cover companies, would that be the no. case? Well, Alliance, well, we look at our, our, our pricing and our planning uh, into the future on, on an annual basis. Um, as I said earlier, pricing will be looked at ongoing on a quarterly basis in terms of adjusting. When we, when we set out our plans, we have to decide where we're going to uh, compete, uh, where we think we can best compete and where we've got the expertise to compete. Uh, so, for instance, you mentioned the haulage business. That's not an area that we would operate in. Uh, we don't have the expertise to, to underwrite that properly. Um, so we, we, would, we wouldn't underwrite that area. So we would take a, a, a view, as I said earlier, on every uh, or any particular sector uh, and take a long-term view that we can operate there uh, sustainably um, and professionally over the long term because we like to get into a market and, and, and stick with it. We don't like to uh, withdraw from markets or, or cause issues that way. So if we can see a long-term future, and again, it's back to the cost of claims. If the level of claims come down, a lot of these sectors that are having problems will find that there will be more uh, competition and more capacity for their business. So again, it links back to the cost of claims being so high. And for some particular in industry sectors, that causes capacity issues. Ms. Muldoon, does FPD refuse uh, insurance to cover? Yeah, I, 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 our underwriting um, risk appetite wouldn't be nearly as wide as 90% of the market. That would uh, d definitely be the case, that we, we w our acceptance criteria would be narrower than that. Like, um, uh, likewise, we do not operate in the haulage area, for instance, which is a, a, the example you have given. We do operate in other difficult risk sectors where we feel we have expertise and where we feel we have something to bring uh, in underwriting terms to the table. And our uh, main... Um, <coughs> Our main uh, criteria is we want to support the markets we're in and we underwrite what we know and a very large part of that is the direct relationships we have 
uh, with men and women up and down the country where the customer is coming in and they are uh, meeting the customer and understanding their business. I, I don't know, uh, Kate, have you anything to add to that? Yeah, I suppose just on the specific point of claims maybe in the, in the process for FBD in, in risk selection. So <clears throat> we look at, um, on any individual risk, we'll look at a lot of information relating to that risk um, in order to determine whether or not we'll take it into the portfolio and what pricing to be charged on an individual basis. Claims experience is one factor in that. Um, for a smaller business who's had one claim in a long period of time where we expect claims because we're in the business of, of I suppose, insuring people who will have claims against them, it may not affect premium. But where there is a repeated um, instance of claims against um, a business, and we think that that may be an indicator of maybe poorer than average health and safety practices or something different to, that has otherwise been experienced in the sector, then that may lead to a premium increase. Do you notify the person that pays the premium of the, if there's a claim against them, the full costs that are paid out in relation to the claim and the uh, the legal expenses as well. Does, does the person who's paying the premium know exactly what was paid out against them and that premium? I believe so. In detail? Yes. It is? By all companies? Because I, I know people who had claims against them and they don't know the full costs of what the legal expenses were against them. For it, takes, it can take a long time. You might know there's a claim outstanding, but it might take three or four years. That's part of the difficulty in the current system. It is adversarial. It takes a long time to go to court. Even after the claim is agreed? And uh, well, no. If it's, a, if, if it's settled, it should pay reasonably quickly. Yes, but uh, the costs, the breakdown of the costs, are they notified to the person that's pay, paying the premium? I'm not sure it's broken down. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that it is. Uh, we would definitely notify them of the award, uh, but sometimes it can take quite the time for the, the legal, the, the legal costs. Whose responsibility would it be to notify the person that's paying the premium uh, that th this is the, the awards that was made against you? This is the breakdown of the cost. This is the legal, how much was paid out in legal fees? How much was paid to the injured injured party? Again, I think it, it depends. I think on the, on the commercial market uh, with, with commercial clients, that would be. Uh, normal for the course. And every year when premiums come up to discuss their, their claims. And Would you think the person that's paying the premium, at the very yes. least, that they should get this breakdown of, of the cost that was involved in the case? Well, I'm not sure what the regulation requirement is on it, but in, in, in terms of being notified of the claim and what's the settlement, absolutely to do. Well, you come in here and you make allegations against uh, the legal profession that they that the legal uh, expenses are out of, out of control. So how does the person that's paying the premium know unless there the claims against them and they're notified of what the claims have been and what the legal expenses well, have been? I think in terms of transparency for the industry now, the industry database uh, is, is started to be populated and, and that information will start to flow into the market. Uh, that was one of the findings from the um, Commission and uh, insurance working no, group. It wouldn't break it down, would it, on, a, on, a, on a yeah. an there is, there is a full detailed breakdown of claims and claim costs within that database. If I, if I have a claim against me or my, or my property, would I get a full breakdown after the case is over? And my, in terms of the industry and, and, and the, the issue of costs and the significance of costs, that will be available through the industry, or the claims database that, that's been set up through the central, this, you central can, bank. Can you not give a, a simple answer as to whether I would get, personally, if I'm paying the premium, whether I would get a breakdown of the costs of the case? As I, say, if I think if you're a commercial customer, yes, you probably do. If you're a personal lines customer or a retail customer, you probably don't. You, get, you will be notified of the, of the claim being settled. Well, that's not good enough at all, I think. I don't think that's good enough in the industry. I'd like to know exactly what the claim against me, how much it was, how much the legal part of it was, how much the legal expenses were to, to both sides, if it was paid to both sides. Well, it's not currently on, on, it's not part of the regulations, it's there. Hold on, but that's not, so we're not talking about, the, sorry for interrupting, we're not talking about the regulations. It should be proper business sense for someone who has, is a customer of yours, that has been sued and should get the full information regarding the cost associated of why his premium is going up. That should be standard practice. Yeah. Um, 
I'm not sure I disagree, but what, uh, we are here to discuss the cost and availability, and uh, that in and of itself would not lower the cost. What will lower the cost will be lowering the bodily injury awards uh, and, the, and getting them to court quicker. That's what will lower the cost. Yeah, but you're saying, Notifying when you come in here, you're saying that the legal costs are out of, out of hand altogether. And the very fact that there's a claim against a person, sure, if they need to know what the breakdown was, how much the legal costs were. Surely, as public representatives here, we have people coming to us uh, that know there are claims made, but we, we cannot get that information from them, so we don't know. We're in the dark well, here as, I, to, I don't as disagree to the claims with that you're making in relation to the legal I don't people. disagree with you, Senator, but I, what I would offer you is knowing that, it will be knowing it after the event, it will not lower the cost. It may well help to lower the cost. Chairman, I have a Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to yeah. um, raise the point. One of the issues that has come across right through all of the hearings is the lack of information and the limited information that's there. So the suggestion made by Senator Burke Senator Lawler relates to information and it may not lower the cost of the premium but it would inform the customer and I'm, a, I'm on the same line as Senator Burke asking that if the customer wants to be made aware of the details around the settlement in any case Surely it would help your own industry and the marketplace to, over a period of time to understand what has happened. And you might have a lesser number of customers giving out about individual insurance companies. And the, quest, the simple question is, on a voluntary basis or on a basis of good business practice, would you not undertake as an industry, to make that information available? And if not, why not? So I may say, Chairman, on, on an industry basis, I think the database that's been set up will answer those questions in an overall no, sense. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you on the basis on, on an individual, of just, you as a business dealing with your customers. Absolutely. And on an individual basis, Alliance regularly, and as a matter of course, uh, consult with our, with our, with our policyholders uh, and get feedback in terms of what uh, complaints they've had, what the issues are or what they would like. And I have to say, that specific thing is not something that has been raised no, no. from our customers. Well, it's raised here today, and I'm asking you to address it, or tell me why you won't. Will you undertake to look at the giving of information to one of your customers relative to a claim, if they ask for it? I think so, uh, um, what's, what's wrong with Chair, that? Uh, Chairman, I, I will undertake, uh, I've been caught on the hop a little bit with it, I will undertake to look at it, but uh, um, so I can't, under, I can't commit yeah, yeah. today, but we will undertake to look at it. Uh, there would be, uh, I would have some reticence if FBD was the only company to go and do that level of disclosure. I feel very strongly that we are publishing far more yeah, of our data than Scotland, everybody yeah. else. So, um, well, um, and we'd have to look at the unintended consequences, but it's not an idea that has been put to us before, and I would be willing to commit to looking at it. and said, you're after charging me too much yeah. there for those sweets, <laughs> I'd have to explain yeah. to them why. Or if you're selling a suit or insurance or a stick of furniture, <clears throat> you would have to explain why you are double the price of others, or whatever it might yes. be. Now, the insurance companies, for some reason, are reluctant to go down that route. Forget regulation, forget everything else. Out of simple good business practice, and keeping your customer on side, and informing the market. Because a lot of people who take out insurance policies of one kind or another are not fully aware of the fact that in those three cases that Mr. Uh, McMahon gave us, that the legal costs are so high. So it actually might be a constructive way of exposing the costs to the market. And it would have a reasonable reflection on the insurance industry 
because now you're helping with the information. And I can understand, Ms. Muldoon, your point that, you know, but why can't you all just jump together in relation to this and provide the information? And I'm not asking for a commitment today. I'm just making the point on behalf of the people that come to me. And, and the second um, piece of that is if, um, that's a if a claim had been made, but if an individual's policy, or premium actually, doubled, which I, and I've seen this in different sectors, would you not write to them and explain why it has doubled, where they have no claim history and so on? Uh, taxi drivers come to me, and I know that's a difficult market. Um, hauliers come to me. But there are others, individuals, that come and say, my insurance premium has doubled. My insurance premium has gone up by, by so many percentage points. And they ask for an explanation, but they don't get it. Is there a reason for that? Well, I would say we do explain as well as we can to our consumers uh, what the, the reason for increases are. Uh, we do it in many different ways, through, through, through newsletters uh, um, and as well as trying to give them as much of a breakdown as we can under, under policy. Uh, in relation to commercial business, most of that discussion and um, thing would happen with the broker in terms of trying to explain the rationale for pricing and where the movements uh, in pricing over time. And often time, uh, we've, when, when we have a, a sector that's difficult, that discussion with brokers and things has gone on for over a number of years. We try not to just uh, react um, in a knee-jerk fashion to, to any sort of one bad year. So it's usually an area where um, we have had profitability issues over a number of years and we can't find a solution other than having to increase. But that discussion takes place with the intermediary who's uh, been but appointed. But there may not always be an intermediary. Um, and even if there is in, a, in in our intermediary, our commercial let, business let me put it this way. I go to my broker. Mm -hmm. I've been with her for years. I have no claims. I have no claims. My insurance on the taxi is six thousand. I go this year and it's twelve thousand. And I say to my broker, "What happened? I'm a good customer. I come to you every year. I haven't gone to any other insurance company. Why has it gone up by six thousand? Now, whether it's a broker or a directly with the insurance company, it goes back to the same point as was made a short time ago. Surely they're entitled to that information." an explanation, out of courtesy if nothing else, to say why it has increased that much. Now, don't any of you get into the, oh, the market this and the market that. Fine, that's okay, but what about the explanation for the individual customer? Why is it that you're reluctant not to go down that road? Well, it's not a reluctance in our heart, I can say, we, in, on an individual basis, if we have been approached, we would always explain the rationale. You haven't, because that taxi driver that came to me, he wasn't told by his uh, well, premium I'm sorry, I, don't, I can't comment on it. I, don't I know you what, can't, and that, what that's that one is. And I can only speak really. for Allianz. But Mr. McGrath, you, you have been very helpful, and all of you have this morning. But the two key pieces that keep coming back to us is information. Information as to how a claim was settled. Surely they're entitled to that. And information as to why the increase in a premium. Surely, on an individual basis, if it goes up that much, they're entitled to know why. And it may be, or oh, the industry that you're involved in is out of kilter and we have to load you. But to load every taxi driver with a 100% increase is not happening. So, why are individual uh, customers? that have had a serious increase in their premium, not being told why they've had that increase. And I can't understand, from a business perspective, why you just don't tell them. Again, I can only answer on behalf of Allianz, and I think we do explain those situations to our customers. In writing? Do you write to them and say, your premium is up by €6,000 because, well, we had to put it up that much? Or do you give them, this is just verbally done. And I'm asking, can you not write to your customers as they are being asked for an increased premium, not just you, Mr. McGrath, but Ms. Muldoon and Mr. Radley, to say why? So 95% of our business is direct. So we do talk to our customers and explain. You will what's explain happening. an increase we, in the premium. We, will. we don't write to them now. We, we, but yeah, but we, you have a one-to-one -one with them. Yes. 
And then in relation to the two companies, Mr Bradley, Mr McGrath, with your um, brokers and with your, your um, direct engagement with customers, would you do the same thing? We, we do in relation to our direct customers. We talk to them all the time and we write to them. Uh, in terms of brokers, we were constantly uh, in discussions with them and debating pricing levels and, and, and other such issues. But is this, and also with them. is this information passed freely to the broker and freely to yes. the customer? Yes. Mr. Bradley. Sorry, I can't. What the broker relates to the client, I can't comment on. Can you not on. make it as part of the you know, proper way of doing business? That at least but, it would be explained. The once, once uh, just to be clear, once a client has applied a, a broker, he becomes our agent and we have to deal with that agent. Uh, what happens between the agent and the client, we can't legislate yeah. for ourselves. Okay, Mr. Bradley. Well, for, direct, for direct customers, we would have that discussion with them. We don't formally set out in writing why, why the cost has changed, but we would have invariably a, a debate with our customer. Um, for intermediary, intermediated customers, we would have long discussions and negotiations with the broker about why the price has changed and uh, the reasons for that. Sorry, Mayor. In point of information, I am a, an Alliance um, a customer, and that is not the case. Can I just ask where your um, 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 telesales and the people who are in contact with your customers are based, maybe for both of you? Because our, my, our my, is, my is, premium increased, and I try to find out why is this? Why, why is it? And absolutely, there was no information whatsoever around it. So I'm just talking from personal experience. Uh, wh where are your data centres? I'm, I'm surprised to hear that, uh, yeah. Senator. And, and well, we'll I can look, only tell we'll you. deal with it for you later, if you like. Yeah. Um, but our operations are all up, uh, out of Dublin 4 um, in uh, Ellen Park. They were all where? Ellen, Ellen Park. Ellen Park, right. And, and yours? Our oh, staff are split 50-50 uh, between Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. And we have a contact centre in Derry, mm -hmm. and so 1,200 people, 600 North Island, 600 Republic of Ireland. And just an alliance, has, uh, has that always been the case where you've been based within the state, where the contact centre has been based within the state? Uh, absolutely, yes. In my 30s, odd years, yeah, no, that's, it's, that's okay, it's always okay. been here in Dublin. Yeah. yeah, I can't dispute <coughs> that. Or, but, or, anyway. Sorry. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Chair, for allowing me. In. I know I'm not a former member of the committee. I have been here on a number of occasions uh, on this insurance debate, and I, I am actually sorry I wasn't here for the when you had the legal professions in, because um, but, uh, I, I missed that. I wasn't here in the channel at the time. I think, um, and I do welcome the people that are here today. Uh, you have indicated that you're only 50% of the industry. It's sad to say that the other 50% refuse to turn up. No, that's not true. Oh, okay. it, 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 uh, we invited the industry yeah. and we were able to accommodate this meeting today. Okay. It's not fair to say that the others refused to attend. We just couldn't find uh, a date and time suitable. And as you can see from this morning's meeting, it takes a considerable length of time to talk to the three companies that are here with us. So okay. the others we will get at a different date. That's fair enough. Uh, the sad part of all this investigation is that one of the areas that we can't actually bring in here, who are actually par uh, responsible for a fair part of this problem, is uh, the judges who are making the awards in the courts. And the Book of Quantum is based on the historical uh, awards that were made in the courts. So that's one area that we can't investigate, but it is a problem. Well, um, well we can send out a message, you see, Senator Lawler, to them that we're having this review, yeah. and that they're more than welcome, welcome to come forward or send a representative here to explain, explain how it's all happening in the courts. And that might be helpful to the process as well. It would. So we don't have any Chinese walls or uh, lack of information from the centre. And likewise with the legal profession, because uh, the insurance companies that are here uh, and you, Ms Muldoon, have said that they're responsible for 40% of all awards made. So from this meeting, we can extend that invitation to the judiciary or the representatives, and we can certainly send it to the um, members of the legal profession. If they want to respond, they're more than welcome to come here to the meeting and give us their side of the discussion. That would, that would be excellent, and thanks very yeah. much for accommodating that. Uh, uh, and as most people know, there are many uh, legs to this stool, 
and we have one of the legs here today. Um, I just have a couple of questions, because uh, mostly rather than repeating over everything. Um, could each of you indicate how much levies are paid per, per 100 euros of premium? You've indicated, you've gone through everything else so far, but no one has indicated to me how much are government levies. Two out of 100, is that right? No, government levies would be seven. And uh, that doesn't include the Motor Insurance Bureau charge, which would be another probably four percent. So, so, just for yourself, uh, can you indicate how much per hundred euros of a premium is a levy? Seven. Seven. Yourselves? It's the same as industry. Seven. Seven. Okay. Seven. So, like, that's a factor that has to be borne into the fact that seven percent of all premiums out there are government levels as a result of failed. Um, uh, industries in the past, so that has to be that's a factor to be taken into. Um, can I ask each and every one the average period, of, the average length, uh, time length of a period of a claim from when actually something happens to when it's actually settled? Um, um, Mr. McMahon, yeah, well, if you uh, look at there's some very complex claims, particularly with uh, young, uh, young, young children, that can take 18, 19 years. Uh, cases in litigation, on average, uh, three to five years. Cases we settle directly would be uh, one to two years. And property cases would be. Uh, property yeah, cases would be. Injury in cases, property cases would settle much, much quicker. Number of days. So if you. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Sean, I was waiting for the light to come on. Um, again, in, in relation to property claims, they're settled very quickly, uh, days or weeks. Um, and in relation to injury claims, they can, if you, if you take a, a value weighted, it's probably about two and a half, three years on average uh, for claims to settle. Yeah. Uh, our opportunity to be very similar, very quick for property claims, two and three quarter years with the average lifetime of a, a personal injury claim. Okay. And it's on the personal injury claims, and I'm, I'm asking this one, is because um, a number of people have come to me saying they have been front-loaded almost immediately when the claim has been put in, right? And there is a cost associated with that. Is that built into your profits? Because no one knows what you're going to pay out at the end of the year, at the end of the whole claim period, but you front-load a lot of clients who have claims against them. Is that built into your profits? Again, we would price to a target level, as I say, of, of, a, of a six percent margin. Um, somebody who has a claim will get a loading, but it, it is not the loading is not going to pay back the claim amount, um, because that would just be given average injury costs are, are twenty thousand uh, euros. I think um, you couldn't obviously get that back from an individual. And the insurance works off the, off the fact that ma the claims of a few are played by the, the premiums of many. So uh, it, it, we, we would try and price to get an overall margin, as I say, of 6% across the portfolio. And that would include the overloading of the claims on individuals? Wh for whatever loading for, 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 for claims or for whatever and, and how the premiums are calculated. It's, built, it's all built into that. Okay. Um, it would be the same situation. Uh, clearly, if somebody has a claim against them, for motor, they could lose their no claims bonus um, at the start, and the claim might be settled three or four years later. But um, all those additional premiums are built into our standard, our standard kind of target mar uh, profit margin. Okay. All right. Okay. That's fine. Um, uh, what was the claim? Uh, obviously, there's been mentioned your overarching body has been currently being investigated. Uh, by the EU with regard to competition rules. Um, I always look at that when I went down to, um, I was at Nace Race last week and I went down through the, the bookmakers stand to have a bet in a horse and they're all charging the same price for the horse. Um, so they're supposed to be individual traders per se, but um, I do have a concern about the fact that uh, there is not much difference between the cost of insurance of a car uh, across all the sectors. So I, I, that has me worried, but I let them look at that. Um, can, can the, last, the last, just come on, on that, please. Sorry, uh, Senator. Just the, the, the investigation from the EU into insurance is in relation to the access to the insurance link database. Mm. It's not about pricing. 
no, or, I know or that. pricing yeah, consistency, no, that. just to be clear on that. Okay, no, and, I'm aware of that. Our, our, our experience, and when you look at any of the uh, surveys that have been done on pricing, there is quite a variation of pricing different across different risks in the market. Okay. Uh, and, and I would add, uh, Senator, that equally importantly in this discussion about price, and it's often lost, is that the strength of the claims paying ability, if you shop only on price, uh, you can end up being in a situation as all of the van customers with Satanta were, where they actually weren't around to pay the claims. So the, the quality of the cover and the what is covered within the policy are an overall component of value and what, in what you're buying and whether the company will be around to pay and what they pay um, is, is, is as important as price. The price of a pint of milk is almost the same in all the supermarkets. But we, so it, it's, competition drives price, but also the quality of the cover and the quality of the product you're, buy, you're buying drive price too. Okay. Um, one last question. Uh, if the judges all got together tomorrow right, and decided that the, the um, book of quantum is too high and that we need to reduce it, uh, and if the, the judges then put in place a new book of quantum and reduced everything down with it, would you reduce your premiums immediately? The purpose of this question is back to force the judiciary to review what they're doing at the moment on a voluntary basis rather than having to put them through the, the whole legal process. So I want to clearly state it that you would reduce your premium, if you're going to say so or not, uh, by what they will reduce the book of quantum by. So, Senator, I think there's an important nuance in there. As yes. the book of quantum comes down, our, uh, as we've said many times in this session this morning, our biggest issue is that the quantum of bodily injury awards made at court is too high. Right. If the book of quantum comes down on its own, they must take the next step and implement, the, use the book of quantum as the I'm, ceiling for the awards. The so they have to not just alter it, but they also have to apply it in the court right, situation. Okay. No, and, and the Should all that happen, happy to confirm okay. that I believe that FBD so will... So if the judges got together and all agreed tomorrow that they were going to reduce the payouts for the soft tissue and the whiplash injuries claims that are made, which are by far the bulk of the claims that are made, and the judges all got together and said, OK, we're going to reduce this down to the level that is in the UK at the moment. You'll bring your premiums down proportionally. Go on. Yeah, yes, I'm just looking I, to clarify because... I, I, and I, like my colleagues from other companies here, I am under... Uh, uh, FBD is under... Um, investigation for price signalling so what we are saying is with from the competition authority and that's a high court uh, equivalent uh, um summons that we're under, so, um, but we are happy to confirm that the cost of insurance is driven by the cost of the inputs, and if the cost of the inputs is lowered, and the main cost is the cost of bodily injury awards, the cost of bodily injury awards come down, I am confident that FBD's insurance prices will follow those costs of input. So you're saying to me that if the judges did that tomorrow morning and reduced the, the awards in the courts themselves, you would follow suit. Sean? Senator, the same, yes. As I've said earlier, Allianz will reflect the cost of claims uh, in its pricing. So as soon as those claims costs reduce, we will reduce our prices. Okay, so if the judges did that, you would reduce the cost. We would. And if the cost of claims comes down, the cost of insurance will come down. Okay. It's important that after the agreement between the judges, they consistently apply what's been yeah, agreed. No, no, and we no, see I that happening. Yeah. Yeah. So if the judges reduced it tomorrow, you reduce your that's, that's all I wanted to find out. Thanks very much. Thanks, Senator. Senator Harkin. Thanks very much. Thanks all of you for being here. A lot of the points have been covered uh, fairly comprehensively. Um, and there's no further it, questions, then? No, I wouldn't go that far. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> but just to make the point, I mean, insurance is... It, it, the cost of insurance, we've had people in here, we've had various witnesses in play centres and, and uh, pubs and restaurants and so on. And it's changing the way people are existing. It's changing how children are playing. It's changing how playgrounds are being designed. It's changing uh, how pubs and restaurants, how nightlife works. It's, it's 
phenomenal the impact that insurance is having. Um, and I'm just wanting to, I know you know that, but I think it's really important that we do when we're talking about this stuff. It's, I'm not here to bash the insurance industry at all. That's not my um, reason to be here. I really want to discuss how we, if you guys were sitting over here, or you were members of finance committees and, and legislators, what would you do? I, mean, I, was a, I was in the chair for the Judicial Council Bill in the Senate last week, and we got to through it in less than two hours, um, the, the, the final stages of it, and it's gone back to the, to the doll to be hopefully done, I think, today. Um, and hopefully that will have an impact. Um, you've talked about the, the, you know, the legal costs are very big. We've had legal people in here saying it's not to do with them, and everybody's entitled to make a claim, and all the rest of it. Um, we've had in, you know, the, the argument about the incentive to claim, that if, if soft tissue injuries were three grand, it's a lot less of an incentive to than if they're 25 grand or 17 grand or 18 grand, um, and that there's no downside. We've, I've made the point before. You go into a bank and you try and rob it and you get caught, you'll probably end up in jail for a little while at least. Uh, you'll certainly have a criminal record. Um, if you make a fraudulent claim, it appears that most of the time, most of the companies don't really pursue to the end, you know, to the, to the last degree, um, what you might do with people and, you know, the 19 cases or whatever it was in the last six months. I'm not here about that. I would like to see a much more systematic that everybody is, anyone who you detect, any claim you reject is sent to the Gardaí, and I'd like a commitment from all of you as to, or even tell me why you don't do that, because clearly you're not doing it. Uh, I know it's hard to prove, but let the guards do that. If you've rejected the claim and the claim isn't paid, You've clearly grounds for that. Um, and maybe you might just outline to me why, any, any or all of you, as to why you don't pursue fraudulent claims. I was a bit concerned, um, as Muldoon, when you said that you're not able to share information about, say, multiple claimants. Now, maybe people are very accident prone. I'm not saying they're all doing it, but some people seem to have a history of having a lot more accidents, a lot more claims. Are you now saying, I thought this famous insurance database was that you all paid a fee to be involved with and were members of meant that you could share information. Are you now saying that GDPR stops you from using or sharing information about um, serial claimants? Those, uh, Before you answer that question, just to go back to what Deputy Doherty was talking to you about earlier on, and you might answer it um, when you're dealing with uh, Senator Harkin. We were talking about fraud. <laughs> and my understanding of what you said was that you, you, you process the claims and as you do that you examine them for the possibilities of fraud and, and um, uh, exaggerated cases and so on. And that that's the figure of 20%. And then the ones that you actually refer to the guards are the ones that you have sufficient evidence for them to pursue. Yeah. And the ones that you don't are the ones that are you believe that there's a wrongdoing, but you can't just get enough evidence for them. So you, you might just explain that, because that was lost, I think, in the, in the um, exchange with Deputy Doherty. I'm sorry, that, Senator, no, just... you're right. I think that's the point. I'm trying to tease out as to why, if 20% or 12,000 or 10,000 or whatever that famous figure of 20% of 65,000, 13,000, whatever it is, how so few managed to get to the Gardaí. Let... Yeah, you've, so reje you've rejected the claim. You said we're not paying out. You have reason to do that. Um, you must have some evidence because obviously people who make a claim and are not just going to walk away and say, that's fine, you didn't pay me, it's grand. Um, I've paid my premium. We I'd like to know why every claim or most claims don't end up hitting the Garda fraud squad or the Garda division. And I just want to make one point about, in my opinion, and I've had this row with the Minister before and I've said it on the record, exaggeration is fraud. There's this idea that Fraud is only fraud if it's a staged claim. Exaggeration. Saying you drove 200 miles when you drove 20 is fraud. Um, it's an exaggerated claim. Um, exaggerated claims may be not as bad as staging an accident with three cars and everybody knows everybody and everyone drives two miles an hour into a pothole or into a roadworks or something. But it, it is fraud. Right. Maybe. We'll do with Sergeant Julia. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, from our perspective, the, the exaggeration issue uh, is more complicated to try and work through. So you're, you're trying to, people can exaggerate the extent of an injury. 
they can uh, add, uh, and an increasing uh, phenomenon is adding the psychological aspect, even to a very minor uh, injury. So that, that the 20% number is the total of um, it's the total of suspected fraud and exaggeration and are, that get looked at. And, and I think it's important that we only discover what we discover. So there could also be others. Um, I think uh, in relation to the database uh, that exists, that is checking for claims and it's a flag. It doesn't give quantum. It says whether there has been a claim or there hasn't been a claim uh, in relation to a particular insured. When I talk about sharing data, we are not allowed to share that I suspect that Fiona Muldoon might have had uh, three uh, claims with another insurance company and now she's coming to FPD. The other insurance company is not allowed to share its suspicions or share any data uh, other than what uh, the regulator uh, stipulates in respect of that customer. So, so can I just ask, what, what is in this famous insurance database? A flag to say that a claim has been settled. Okay, so somebody comes in, my name goes in and, oh, they've had a, they've had a claim. Yeah. That's all. You don't claim have the size of the claim? And, yeah. and, you, and would it say I've had seven claims or 12 claims or just? Uh, I believe it will say how many, yes. Okay, so there is a, a certain element of, right, yeah. so and so there has are, had yeah. 55 claims in the last three yeah. years or whatever, yeah. or the last 20 years. And how far does that database go back? Is it a six year thing? Is it, is it uh, forever? Is it historic? You Can you go back and look at my. It's a cut off. Have to check, Senator, sorry, uh, you got okay. us there. No, it's just. Just a, a point. Um, in terms of what you're doing as companies, in terms of telemetry, technology, uh, putting devices in cars, whether it be cameras to watch people's driving, um, things to check people's speed, you know, obviously better driving, better roads we can argue about, and that's, that's an important part of it too, better road design, better engineering, but better driving. I mean, surely speed is a part of it, alcohol is a part of it, all the various other aspects we know that are involved with road crashes. What are you doing to keep a better eye on your customers to make sure that they're not doing what they shouldn't be doing and reward those who are behaving properly? Yeah, with the pri uh, primary mechanism for rewarding those who drive well is that uh, no up to 75% in a no claims uh, uh, bonus discount can be awarded. And um, we had telematics previously. Um, it, it, the take up on it was uh, very poor. Uh, we believe there is more opportunity for that and we uh, are in development on two, two particular products that would um, go both to driving and other aspects that might help lower the cost of insurance for the individual because of either the manner of their driving or how much they're driving. And, and either of Allianz or Axel, have you any idea, thoughts in that regard? Again, Allianz, is, as part of a group, we're, we're uh, leveraging group technologies and, and uh, development, particularly in the telematics area. Um, we have uh, an Allianz Safe Driver app, which um, monitors the level of braking and acceleration and speeding uh, and, and uh, records the trip that, that um, drivers are, are undertaking. So that's been rolled out, and so I think it's going to be a, an increasing feature in, into the future, but it's a, it's a developing technology. And... Uh now for AXA, we, we have a telematics offering, have had quite a few years, about 20 million of business on it. Um, it gives people an initial discount of 20% for having the technology in their car, and a further 10% then if they, if they reflect some very good driving behaviour. In addition to that, on some simpler technology, we have a partnership with the Dashcam company, which gives a 10% discount for, for putting in a, an approved Dashcam. And how does that work then? Is, is everything uploaded automatically or is it only looked at in terms of... The, the telematics is uploaded automatically in the dash cam. It's uploaded in the event of a claim, but clearly it, no, on the, it's the person who owns the dash cam footage is the, is the insurer to the driver. In, in terms of, I mean, we, we see a certain amount of visibility when stuff goes to court and we see somebody got 85,000 from Starbucks because they had tea under their arm or somebody had a hot chocolate on a Ryanair plane or whatever it was. Um, and we know that about 70% of claims are, are settled, 20% are PIAB, 10% are court. We, what, I mean, are there 
you're here now, Insurance Ireland would generally tell, tell us they don't have the information, so you were here. Do you look at clusters of either geographic areas, uh, parts of cities, parts of counties, families, and say, what's happening here? We have a history of claims. How, how is that looked at or examined? How do you, I mean, clearly it's in your interest to reduce payouts. I mean, I know we're all paying the premiums, but what are you doing to tackle places that seem to be much more accident prone than other places? Or do you do anything on that? Well, there, there are two approaches. One, in relation to pricing, uh, we'll look at different geographic areas um, and in, terms of in, in, a, in a detailed way, but largely in relation to fraud, um, or so, so we'll be careful maybe the definition of what we're calling fraud, but in terms of exaggerated or suspicious claims, um, the 20% we talk about, we'll run quite sophisticated uh, stats and analysis in the background to find those clusters and links uh, to do with different families or to do with different areas. Uh, and, and investigate that way. And would it be fair to say that those links and those, that does happen? There are Absolutely, parts of yes. the country or parts of a city or well, a town in any, that are more prone to claims than other parts? There, there are definite links uh, to various groupings, whether it be geographic or family or areas or trades or whatever. We can definitely find links. Uh, and do they ever get reported to the Gardaí? Again, they do. We, we reported 48 in the last uh, 12 months, um, and it's, it's ongoing. It's something we're, we're developing and improving all the time, um, but yes. And um, yourselves? Well, if there's, certainly there's a lot of factors that go into pricing, and the frequency and severity of claims would, and that would, that would pick up any kind of, whether it was uh, geographic or, um, or any other factor that, that made that, that segment stand out. And do you refuse, I mean, you, can you refuse cover or do you just price it to such an extent that they'll never want to buy it? Well, you, you can choose to refuse cover, um, but we would have a very wide footprint and would offer, would offer a code to over 90% of the market. So, so there's 10% of the market you won't? Well, we won't without referral. Okay, just, just in terms of... Um, I know, yeah, okay, yeah, give me two minutes maybe, Kerr. I'm a, I'm a chair of a school board, and I know of other schools that were in a, a group scheme, I think it was an Allianz group scheme, and it went from the scheme finished, and they said, right, well, now it's gone from 27,000 to 34,000, and you were in a good scheme, it's over now, and um, there's no new scheme, and uh, you had a good price before, and that was the excuse for going up by seven grand, no claims, no nothing. How do you explain that to a school that just went up significantly without any incidents or accidents? A significant amount of money. Well, again, it's down to uh, sector-specific issues. I mean, Alliance is a, is a big insurer in, in the schools area. Um, we have been for a very long time. We recognise the fact that schools are under pressure uh, due to capitation grants, and it isn't open to them to, to raise funds from year to year. So, as I said, we take a very long-term, sustainable approach to our pricing in, in these sectors, and we try to limit the level of increase as much as we can. But again, it's back to sometimes the level of claims costs is what it is, and it has to be priced for. Um, okay, well, just in, in real... We have in, in the doll, and okay. I right. had agreed to conclude at half one. Okay. Right. Um, the witnesses have been here since half ten, and the vote is actually to do with uh, the topic that we're discussing. So I'm sorry for cutting across you, uh, Senator. Should um, we have another day? Yeah, I thank you all for your thank you. I want to thank the witnesses. Thank you. Um, for being present here this morning and for the open and frank statements uh, that you have given. And I hope you will engage with us again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the meeting is now adjourned.